All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Exciting episode here today with returning guest, Mr. Matt Landman of Spiro Gear, which is a silver based clothing line meant to protect from EMF. Our previous episode is not up here on the podcast since we got taken down. I didn't put up every single old podcast, but you can listen to that episode on YouTube and I will put that link in the description. Matt, since most people won't watch that old episode, do you want to give us a quick rundown of who you are and how you got into this whole EMF and chemtrail type of uh, topic? Hi, yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, for sure. And um, cut me short if I go too long on that. Um, I like to tell people that I grew up a pretty normal person. I never thought I'd become an activist. And I've walked many, you know, I've worn many different hats and walked many different paths and done a different bunch of different jobs and all this stuff. Um, how I woke up to first geoengineering weather modification chemtrails is I got a job on a farm and I witnessed weather engineering, specifically drought causation. Uh, we were in the middle of a drought and we were expecting this big storm to come and these planes came and gridded the sky with these persistent linear cirrus cloud formations on the back of the jets and we didn't get any rain. And I started to, through a few conversations and you know, synchronized divine kind of lineups, I started to question what was going on in the skies and then realized that nobody was really talking about it. Nobody really knew anything about it. And I started hosting conferences and then finally made my movie Franken Skies um, in 2017. I'm working on a sequel. And while I was working on Franken Skies, the movie, um, I lived right next to a smart meter. I was working on the movie and sleeping and working from home. Um, I mean, just being an activist, but I was at home all the time. And um, not to lessen it, not just being an activist, but I was an activist for chemtrails, working from home, making my movie. And I got EMF, um, I got radiation sickness from a smart meter, from being next to it all the time. I started being unable to sleep and, and having um, electrical, like electric feelings in my hands when I would touch like a smartphone or anything like that. And I didn't put it together until finally I did. And I started having to sleep on the other side of the house. And I learned the detriment of smart meters and then um, this word 5G started popping up and I didn't like how chemtrails was so daunting and like it's it's a hard one to stop. I mean, first, we got to bring the awareness to the people and it's like protecting ourselves from it is even hard as well. It's it's like I don't like to be a victim to things, but in the chemtrail space, you can only do so much. You know, you can mineralize, you can chelate and detox, you can raise awareness, make movies, make documentaries, you know, hold protests, all these sort of things but still they're doing it more and more all the time. But the EMF space, I felt like there's got to be more of a solution. You know, we can stop towers from going up. We can protect ourselves through education and um, awareness and shielding and grounding and all that. And so I took a more proactive, not that I'm not taking a proactive approach with chemtrails, but less victim oriented approach with the EMF because there is something that can be done. So many people say, oh, well, what are you going to do? So, well, I started a clothing line and I'm raising this awareness and protecting people and bringing this education to people so that they know. And so, yeah, I started this over clothing line, but it's evolved into um, grounding stuff and education and awareness. And you know, I'm just plugging along with that. But it's really exciting to be here and to have the products to offer people to bring that awareness forward. Like my phone bags, just having the phone, the Faraday blackout phone bag, people are walking, talking, um, not just advertisements, but activists. People ask why you put your phone in the bag. What you? What do you mean your phone doesn't work inside? Why? Oh, because there's radiation, and you know I'm mitigating it, and I don't want to be around as much. And you know the silver blocks it, and la ti da, and so it's it's important for people to get there. And thanks for that. I still use mine, by the way. Oh, the green screen's not showing it up. I uh, no, don't take right. my phone outside very often. That's I think an important thing to promote there. But when I do, it's in the bag. So I think before we dive in, I would like to say I do say it often, but I don't think often enough that I am in the supplement business, health, food, nutrition. This is very important. But for a very long time now, we're coming on eight, nine years or something. I've been in the EMF space as well. And I promise it is the biggest 
and at least fastest growing problem. Because in the food, we have choices. We have lots of options. 10 years ago when I started in the business, there was no such thing as a gluten-free section at the grocery store. Now there's a gluten-free section and health section at practically every grocery store, even Walmart. Organic food is more available. Information about good food choices is more available. People are even onto seed oils now. No one was talking about seed oils 10 years ago except for us. So these things have become out there in the ether and part of popular culture, and that's great. More choices. More affordable, even. Organic food and stuff, it costs less than it used to. The gap between good food and bad food is no longer that different. Supplements are more available, and information about supplements are also more available as well. These are both in your control, and that's fantastic. But... There are so many people eating well, supplementing well, and still experiencing problems. And to me, the next biggest thing on the list is EMF. And it's something that is not being addressed by the majority of healthy living people. Hashtag healthy living people, right? You see all these people out there jogging and they're at the gym. You know, they're trying to work on their fitness and their health. And most of them are making good health choices. And yet they're wearing Bluetooth headphones. They've got a microwave in their pocket. Then the gym itself has... If there's 50 different people in it, there's 50 different phones in it, all giving off their own signal. It's uh, it's incredible. And again, it's not being addressed. It's not getting any better. In fact, it's gotten way worse. Matt, since you and I spoke last, I don't know if that was three or four years ago. Oh my gosh, it's gotten a lot worse, right? It's out of control now. Towers are everywhere. There's zero attention being paid to this, at least in North America here. Our governments do not care about this at all. It's a complete joke to them. You can't even sue a cell phone tower company based on health grounds. You can only sue them based on aesthetic or property value grounds. It's, it's pretty insane. So like I said, in brief here, we have control about a lot of things to do with our health. You can choose fitness. You can choose to go to sleep at a reasonable hour and have good sleep habits. You can choose good food. You can choose good supplements. But you cannot choose to avoid EMF. Not easily. There are some things that you can do and I would like to get into them. But yeah, it's a... It's a massive, massive problem now. Have you noticed the escalation in the EMF affecting the effectiveness of your silver phone cases and clothing? Oh, definitely. It's it, it's increasing exponentially, really. Um, the 5G technology utilizes um, the cell phones. So if you're in a room and you've got 5G tech, that are all um, the same carrier, then they start to together make a network. They're like, oh, there's, uh, I don't know what carrier you have, maybe Rogers or whatever, let's just say that. So say there's a, uh, in, in the room, there's five people with Rogers phones. Their phones will know that they're all together and they'll create a network together to um, basically create a beam form to get the signal ramped up to be able to make the 5G infrastructure. So the phones are all working together in conjunction now. And if you get more together, if they're more potent. Regarding the phone bags, I've had to modify them a handful of times. And that story is, is very poignant. And being in my position, in the shoes that I'm in, it's like firsthand the knowledge that I've gained. It's very important to share with um, the, with the world. So firstly, I make these phone bags. And once I tell the story, it'll make a lot more sense why this knowledge is very important. Um, but I'm in this position to be learning this stuff. And I, it's important that I try to convey this. So these phone bags that I have, you drop your phone in. And what happens is it's called a Faraday bag. You don't get any signal inside. So it's just like a blackout phone bag. And when I came out with the company in 2017 and 18, I had my, um, the, the people who make my product, they were providing foam bags for other companies around the world. And everybody who sold these Faraday foam bags would sell them to people with all different phones and different carriers, all smartphones around the world. And you put your phone in and it would just black out the phone. The alarm works, but the text messages don't come through. Nothing comes through. No signal, no EMF radiation and no signal. Signal equals radiation. So, and then I was all happy and excited to start the company selling these phone bags. And I had eight colors and that's how I started the company, Sparrow. Um, I started the company just selling phone bags only. And then I started coming out with caps, hats. So come 2019, I was really selling them and 
and got a warehouse and was like really jazzed about getting the gear out there. Um, I take that back. I didn't have my warehouse then. I got, I had my office, but either way, the progression of the company. So in 2020, in March, 2020, when we all experienced this big shift in our lives and there was these lockdowns, everyone's scrambling to figure out their lives because, you know, different, their businesses are shut down. Whatever's happening, there's so much going on. And at the same time, my phone bag stopped working. They worked for years going into March 2020. But all, and, and I have customers that were really happy. They put, them at their, um, they put the phone in there while they go to the park or when they go to bed or when they go to work or when they go on a date or whatever, no signal gets through. Come March 2020, signal started getting through the phone bags and people were upset. I got a lot of customers complaining. I didn't know what to do at first. I was scrambling. I thought it was manufacturer's defect. I was collecting old phone bags and replacing them with phone bags. And still people were like, no, the signal's getting through. This phone bag worked great for me, but now it doesn't. I'm like, well, troubleshooting. Did you get a new phone? Did you get a new upgrade? You know, what happened? And people are like, no, no, no. I've got my old phone. I don't know what's going on. So slowly but surely, I started to realize that the smartphones were the signal was getting turned up to propagate the new 5g carrier wave which is a totally different technology than 4g and like i was trying to explain it utilizes a, a network system where the all the local cell phones that are in the same carrier work together to create a network to push the signal to ramp it up further to get to the next um, spoke in the wheel or node or small cell or whatever it may be the cell phones become nodes like small cell towers in this system of 5G, making it completely different than its predecessor 4G, but I can get to that. So basically the phones are are exponentially increased. The, the, the new radiation coming off the phones, it's a new type of radiation. It's 5G and 4G are totally different. So to say it's like a hundred times more radiation, it doesn't even give it justice because it was a type of radiation we'd never been exposed to, humanity. So all of a sudden people are exposed to this new type of radiation that's, if I was going to give it a number, I would say it's like 100 times more potent than its predecessor, which is 4G. Nobody knew that their phones were getting turned up to such a degree, right? They get an update in the middle of the night, they don't even really know. But all of a sudden the phone bags are being penetrated to the point where I had to troubleshoot and work with my provider, um, who I get my manufacturer, and we... The, whereas one layer of silver would black out the phones, now I made a phone bag that was two layers of silver, so 100% more silver. And I gave those out to everybody who was complaining and started selling these bags, and they indeed worked. They blacked out the phone bags. So the, the fabric that was blocking out the signal had to be doubled now to be able to block out the signal. And so people are happy again. And then I still hadn't really put it together 100%. I've gone to business school. I graduated top of my class with a master's in business administration with a focus in strategic sustainability. And I, I was the top of my class in statistics. And in statistics, your number's crunching, right? And you don't go and say something is causal until you can really prove it with the numbers. There's corollary things. You know, you can, um, you can identify corollary, correlations and corollary relationships. But I never would have said that it was definitely... Um, cranking up of radiation on phones that were leading to people getting sick until um, the Omicron variant came out. So my phone bags worked just fine, the two layer silver, and then Omicron variant came out. And then all of a sudden people are um, showing symptoms of low level radiation sickness yet again. And my phone bags again are not working. And I mean, you got to buy a whole bunch at a time when you, when you do these things and stuff like that. So I'm scrambling trying to figure out, you know, Am I really in the same situation I was, you know, eight months previous when, um, when there was lockdowns? I'm watching my words, right? So during the lockdowns, my phone bags didn't work. I replaced them with two layers. Now Omicron variant came out and all of a sudden the phone bags aren't working again. And people are showing symptoms of low level radiation sickness, loss of hair, uh, loss of taste and all this sort of things, fevers and whatnot. And so I'm scrambling trying to figure out what's going on. And I had to introduce a new material, which is this copper nickel blend, which is really dense and thick. And with that, two layers of silver, and then a third layer of the copper nickel, I make these now foam bags that block out the signal and have and still work, right? But I had to triple them up and introduce a new material because again, the radiation increased so much that I had to modify and make a whole new foam bag. After doing all the research and seeing and talking to all these people that were complaining and also getting sick and all this stuff and 
being in the position that I'm in, I concluded not just a maybe, right? This isn't just like, oh, corollary relationship. I've concluded that the lockdowns and all that stuff that we witnessed in 2020, all of that that we witnessed was a smoke screen for the increase in EMF radiation that everyone was about to witness to propagate the 5G signal. So everyone's got these phones in their pockets and the 5G towers getting thrown up everywhere. Um, trees are getting cut down because the 5G signal would absorb into these trees, and not be able to go as far in, in city streets and whatnot. But the 5G carrier wave, which we will we'll talk about, it's very absorptive. So it does a lot of impact on things that it hits, including humans, human cells. And we were really showing impacts of it when, introduced, when the technology was introduced. And so there had to be a big, you know, smoke screen or, you know, psychological deterrent where people wouldn't realize exactly what was going on. So people didn't put two and two together and people still don't realize how detrimental it is. And they're walking around with these things in their pocket that got everyone sick for a couple of years. But here we are. And thanks for listening. I hope that made sense. Well, it does to me because I was actually in the exact same situation. I was selling a phone case before I met you, by the way, when we had a real life store. The store is still there, but I'm not there. We were selling the cases. And then when I started a website of my own in 2019, I was selling the cases there as well. And they worked until one day they didn't work. Same thing, exact same thing. And it kind of baffled me for a little bit, but it seemed pretty obvious to me that it was just a turning up. They turned it up. I don't know what exactly that means. They just turned it up and now it doesn't work anymore. And uh, by the way, you said you don't know what carrier I have. I do not pay a phone bill. And this has been one of my big sources of activism here. You know, there's very little that I can actually do myself. I'm not going to go and burn down a cell phone tower myself. You know, I have a family and responsibilities and stuff and we can't all be anarchists like that. But what I can do is not pay the criminal cartel, right? It blows me away that anyone would speak out against a company or an industry and then still pay those people. It blows my mind. You know, if you hate Walmart or Starbucks, don't shop there. It's very simple. Don't support them and maybe encourage other people not to do it as well. And yeah, I haven't paid a phone bill in years because they are criminals and they are Amazing. radiating us. And I run a business online. I'm on social media to make my living. I do not pay a phone bill. I've heard very uh, limited, believable reasons why anyone needs to actually have data service. Because that's what it really is here. I want to make this clear. Paying your phone bill and the cell phone towers, it's not really about phone service. Phone service itself is a totally different thing. And maybe you can back me up with the technical details there. But a cell phone tower that actually gives you cell phone service is completely different from these cell towers that we see that are, have all these square pads on them and stuff. That's for data. And to me, the problem is data. The problem is not actually a cell phone itself, but I still don't want to pay the cartels. And you don't need a phone bill. I'll put that link in the description. You can watch my video, How to Live Without a Phone Bill, because you can totally do it. And I travel cross country, cross, cross continent and stuff. You can do it without a phone bill, I promise. But yeah, the point is it's data. The data towers are the ones that are radiating us, radiating us the most. The 5G is data. 4G is data, right? 3G is data. That has nothing to do with phone service at all. That's so that you can be on TikTok while you're in line at the grocery store or watch HBO while you're driving or whatever. Completely unnecessary activities that always have been. Or play Pokemon and get hit by a car while you're crossing the road or something. That's what data is for. It's for these useless entertainment activities and I'll rant more later about that, but I'm just saying, I don't pay a phone bill. No one should pay a phone bill if you're concerned about this at all, because that would immediately reduce the, the radiation. If we stop paying these people to put up the 5G then, and 4G and all this stuff, then the problem goes away. What do you think? What's the difference between actual cell phone uh, signal and data signal? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm glad that you don't have a phone. Um, it's really, I don't either. I had a 3G service a couple of years ago. They said they're canceling it and that I had to get an upgrade. And I just said goodbye to the cell phone. I have a landline. I also have Ethernet, uh, wired internet. Um, so I don't do uh, EMF wired wireless radiation. I don't do wireless at all. I don't do Bluetooth. Um, so I mitigate in that way. I like to lead by example. I think it's really important to show the next generation that there is a life outside of being on your device all the time, you know, if, if, if you're trying to sh 
show the children, but then you're all plugged in the whole time. They're going to want to do that too, right? You can show them there's other ways. And then, hey, look, look at that ladybug that I wouldn't have noticed otherwise kind of thing. So yeah, it's really important. And I've got um, a big social media followership. I go on uh, podcasts and radio shows all the time. I've got an online business. Um, I'm, I've, I've got enough exposure to the internet, just like everyone else. But no, I don't have it on me all the time. I, I, I have my time where I sit down at the computer and I post my memes and do my things. But aside from that, I don't have to be on there all the time. And neither do you. No one does, really. Um, to be able to talk on the phone, the carrier waves that we have are, I mean, that we need are very um, elementary. And these are um, not these super fast uh, data that you described, like 5G and all that sort of stuff. In order to be able to talk on the phone, we need something to the extent of having um, like FM signal like like something as small as like a radio waves right and these signals basically um size is is the is the most important factor as to like whether you're getting radiated or not whatnot so there's carrier waves and carrier waves are all around us carrying information and it's light the so, so technology has utilized light waves to be able to carry data and information on and light travels at a certain speed, 186,000 miles per second, has this um, characteristics. It's in a waveform, and the more waves per second is, is how many hertz there are. And um, you sent me an interesting article about um, clothing and its hertz and frequency, and I'd love to talk about that as well because everything is very um, related. It's all connected, the frequency of the light bulbs around us, the food that we eat, the media we expose ourselves to, the frequencies we surround ourselves with, the clothes that we wear, everything. Um, but to be able to get the data that we claim that we need with 5G and self-driving cars and all this instant nonsense, um, the, the carrier wave that's being utilized is a millimeter size wave that is the width of a penny that cannot travel very far, that absorbs into everything it hits and is actually weaponized technology. This is very predatory. This isn't, should not be used by telecom. All telecom needs are carrier waves that are actually large enough to go quite some distance. Remember before we didn't need these small cells on our doorstep? Well, we still don't. We don't need them every 500 feet all over the place. They need to be on a mountainside, you know, very far away emitting, um, it's still light, but it's light with a size wave that's not detrimental to our health. Imagine that, right? This is so, like a radio station, right? A radio station doesn't need like you said, a bunch of lamppost transmitters everywhere in town on every street. It needs one big one and you can drive for like three hours and still listen to the same radio station. Right. And they're usually up on hills. Yeah, it's which is still probably a problem exactly. to me. Honestly, all EMF is a problem. But the scale here that we're talking about now with data is is way, way different. Yeah, it's, it's predatory at this point. And, and it's absorptive because of the size of the carrier wave. When you're dealing with carrier waves that are larger than a human being and they just coast on by you, but you can still get information on there and receive information on there and do your phone calls and all that stuff, it's not predatory. I mean, but when you're dealing with carrier waves that are the size of a um, developing um, human, when, they're, when, when, you know, when the fetus is developing in the woman's uterus or whatever, I mean, these things at the end of the day, they're so predatory that it looks like that it's a depopulation agenda that these carrier waves that are being utilized now, they're very absorptive and children that are conceived, born and raised in a full on 5G environment will likely be infertile. And then it's just this whole agenda being rolled out, transhumanism agenda, where it's basically to order out of chaos to control people when they can't um, reproduce and and at, at that stage in the game, people will be more bound to their government and listen to everything they say and be doing CRISPR uh, test tube babies and all sort of nonsense. But it's all, I mean, it depends on how far down the rabbit hole you want to go. What's really important is understanding that the radiation coming off of all these devices is absorptive and, and slowly but surely it does cause harm. It absorbs into your skin because your body thinks it's light and your entire endocrine system, hormonal system is based on the light that you absorb, your circadian rhythm, whole bio field, everything is connected to the sun and the sunlight. 
And uh, if you don't understand this, it's important to grasp because we're blasting ourselves with blue light and frequencies off of our light bulbs and our phones and all this stuff. And we're not realizing that we're getting fatigued and depressed. And especially if we have children, we're not understanding the detriment that we're doing by, you know, being around them with the phone. Like, I mean, there's so many different things that people need to, to grasp. For one, when you're on your phone, it's like a ball of light. And that ball of light at this point is basically filling the room that you're in. Okay. It doesn't, if you've got a t an infant and the infant is like five feet away from you, you're like, Oh, I'm over here with my phone. No big deal. No, the light that's coming off your phone is radiation and it's filling up the room that you're in. If you've got a Wi-Fi router, same thing. It's like filling up the room, you know, Bluetooth radiation, same thing. It's, it's blasting the entire room, uh, baby monitors, same thing. These things, all these wireless devices are very impactful and they're filling the room that you're in with radiation. Go in the next room, you're probably getting away from it and that's great unless there's a cell tower in that next room. So it's important to grasp what you're surrounding yourself with. Don't expose your children to as much as you are now, you know, less is more. And even get yourself an EMF meter so that you can be like, wow, I really need to throw these earbuds in the trash. Like what have I been doing microwaving my brain? These things, these wireless earbuds, the wireless headphones, they communicate through your brain. They don't just talk to the device that's in your pocket or whatever. They communicate with each other through your brain, sending through your brain different frequencies. And if you learn about binaural beats and how easily um, influenced our brain waves can be and, and brain tumors and all sorts of things, you don't want frequencies just blasting through your brain. It doesn't make any sense. Right? So, learning about these things and mitigating your exposure because knowledge is power, but really knowledge plus action equals power because you, you take what you know and then you utilize it to mitigate your exposure. And then, you know, you see the beneficial impacts. Now, Matt, some of the things you said might lead some of the audience to think this guy's crazy. So I want to, I want to jump in here and back you up. When I first started the cell phone tower account, it was originally called towers are coming. The reason that I made the account was, first of all, I was blown away by how much towers there were in America, especially in Detroit, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles, where I was traveling between that triangle very regularly. And I didn't notice how big of a problem it was until I started doing that, because I lived in small towns and stuff, and there's a few cell phone towers, but it, it wasn't that visible to me. So I saw that there was a lot of them. But then I started driving across the country, especially across the deserts, you know, out west of America, it's practically empty. So I'm driving through, you know, Wyoming and uh, Utah, like northern Utah is empty, empty, empty. It's like you see signs that are like no services for 60 miles and just crazy how empty it is. And Nevada as well. Outside of Vegas, it's totally empty. And yet I'm seeing these clusters of cell phone towers in the middle of nowhere and not the big, tall skinny ones with a, not a lot of tech on them, the traditional actual cell towers for, for mobile service. So you can speak to people on the phone. It wasn't those towers. It was the same ones that I saw in the city. They're relatively low. They got a bunch of pads on them. They look really scary. You know, they look like Sauron's tower, right? Like they couldn't have made them uglier if they tried and more intimidating looking. But I'm seeing clusters of them, like three, four, five, six of them in a row in the middle of Utah where there's no town, there's no services for 20 miles or 40 miles or, or something like this. And I'm thinking, there is no possible way that this is for data service. This is this is BS. I thought originally, well, when I was doing these long thinking sessions on these long drives, what could they be for? I really just thought it was for weather modification. But I do think it's even deeper than that. And even when I said earlier, if we stop paying them, they'll stop putting towers up. I do kind of doubt that as well, because I do think that this is actually a deep state agenda and that these are deep, and that these will be put up regardless of cell service or not, because I don't actually think it is entirely for data service. Maybe some of it is, but there's also a bunch of random tech on it. There's a bunch of big booms on it that apparently are for like radar or military or train lines. I'm told all kinds of different things since I've been running that cell phone tower account for a long time. So I'm not sure exactly what to make of all this, but. When you see clusters in the most isolated spots in America, you have to think twice about these being purely for data, even though I ridicule the idea of them being put everywhere for data because it's stupid that we're on TikTok in, in line at the grocery store and watching HBO while we're driving. But I do think there's more to it. 
And I know you're deep into this, so I'm not afraid to go all the way into the deep end. What do you think or what do you know about the extra tech or the extra capabilities of these towers? Well, definitely there's weather, weather is involved, right? Um, under the, the guise of 5G infrastructure, there's towers being thrown up everywhere. And these are essentially microwaves. So in conjunction with the geoengineering, the chemtrails, um, you've got the, the, the chemtrail planes, drones, and all this sort of nonsense. They're spraying metallic aerosols in the sky. They're mixing different metallics aluminum, barium, strontium, what have you. Then they're using um, localized ground-based stations to essentially microwave those aerosol plumes. It used to be technology called HARP. HARP was a big antenna array in Alaska that would pick a focal point in the atmosphere around the world and use the intersecting radio waves to heat the atmosphere. Just like you put something in the microwave, you put something in the microwave and there's radio waves blasting it from both angles, having intersection of radio waves at where the food is. And then the water molecules that are in the food, they oscillate and they heat up from, from vibration through intersection of radio waves. Same thing in the sky, um, ground based stations shoot uh, radio waves into the sky and have them intersecting at, you know, large focal points where big swath of aerosols have been sprayed and then that is part of it, it's all integrated the program so they spray the skies they mix the chemicals they zap the skies with ground base stations and then they play this game oh global warming is here because they've superheated the sky and created heat wave right well they're actually in most cases creating conditions to sell that story of global warming climate change where they're actually creating the problems, Hegelian dialectic, problem, reaction, solution. They're creating the problem, selling the reaction, which is fear, and then pushing their solution, which is they're coming out saying, we've got a solution to global warming. It's geoengineering. We're going to dim the sky with spraying the aerosols in the sky. They're bringing the problem back as the solution. And that's kind of a thing that the you know deep state does. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Um, also, yeah, maybe they need their data everywhere because on the highway, you wouldn't get to get on your TikTok if you were out in the middle of nowhere. So they could have um, different towers relaying the signal and working with all the phones, right? So if you've got a phone on the freeway, that phone is being used as a node, a mobile node in the cell tower network to push the signal around. And so it makes sense for them to be on the freeway. But I think that they're um, multi-purposed. I think that there's some that just spy on people. I think there's some that mess with the weather and then some are for data and what have you. There's a video that I have that I push around on social media a lot of a cell tower on fire and they're interviewing the um, representative for the telecom network and they're asking them like the news is they're saying, why is it on fire? And what's this cell tower for? And he's like, I don't want to talk about that. He's like, I'm not going to discuss what this tower is used for, right? I mean, if it was just a phone thing, they would have been like, ah, it's just a phone thing. But no, I think there's um, there's a lot going on, especially spying, um, but also probably ELF mind control kind of stuff. Like, like literally, it's a spiritual war we're in from every single angle. And when you start to realize it, it's like, wow. But really, to take a big step back and to ask yourself why, it can be actually very empowering. So the food, the water, the air, I mean, like our media, our clothing, our light bulbs, like everything is under attack. But why? Like, why are they pulling out all the stops? It's because they're terrified of us, really, at the end of the day. So take that as an empowering aspect of your existence, that your evolution and your spiritual like attunement the powers that be are absolutely terrified of you and they want to attack your pineal gland through emf and glyphosate and 5g and all this sort of stuff and the day that we come into our true um potential is the day that all of this kind of you know crumbles and we see the the real battle for what it is you know, right now it's all covert right so it's like oh no we're not doing that oh no we're not spraying chemtrails as they grid the sky and then tell us we've got a solution it's chemtrails we're gonna do it to you next year but not now you're welcome it's like same with the 5G. I mean, all of it, really. 
But to answer your questions about the towers randomly, it's, it's a lot. And it depends on who you're talking to, really. Some people aren't ready for all of the answers to the questions. I mean, there's definitely mind control, mind control stuff going on out there. There's definitely depopulation through an attack on fertility, which is a certain size carrier wave that is meant to decimate um, sperm cells and developing um, eggs in, in young, you know, newborn children. Um, and then, yeah, weather modification, all that sort of stuff. So, and none of it, they're going to tell us, right? We've got um, this next rad now, like these golf ball looking things. They're $25 million um, weather engineering devices. They, they claim that they're for predicting the weather. But the ir irony is that they actually use frequencies to microwave and steer storms and create and determine and engineer the weather with these things. The next rad stations, I've got one on my hillside. I live in Ashland, Oregon and Mount Ashland. I can go outside and see this thing. And people that I know wake up at three o'clock in the morning in cold sweats. And I think that this thing is emitting all sorts of different frequencies to predict the weather. Yeah, but also control the weather and control the populace. So there's a lot, you know, through ELF, different um, frequencies while they're sleeping and whatnot. So there's a lot going on. And really, you got to pick your battles and know who you're speaking to. As an activist, it's important to gauge your audience and to know what kind of information the person you're talking to is ready for. So you don't just shoot yourself in the foot. You know, some people aren't ready for the talk about chemtrails. So I just point out the beautiful blue skies and then rise the question when there are those grid patterns like, wow, those natural clouds aren't there anymore. And look at all this uptick in air traffic. But not everyone's ready for all of it. So that's my pitch on that one. It is something I know that a lot of people aren't ready for. And like I said, even in the health business, I'm exposed constantly to health conscious people. And it's very difficult to even get them to broach the subject that EMF might be bad for them. And I think one part of it is the addiction to the devices themselves. Another part of it is uh, guilt and shame for exposing their families to it, especially when they mm -hmm. discover that the effects are much worse on children and babies. And, you know, a lot of people are letting the iPad babies babysit their child now, just like we used to with TV. But the TV was nowhere near as bad as holding a microwave in your hand right up to your face. So there's a lot of reasons why people don't want to admit this. And people are very, very... Uh, hard pressed to get them away from the conveniences, the so-called conveniences that a lot of these devices bring, which I think are all overrated. You know, you and I are both wearing uh, headphones with wires attached to them right now. I personally think that's a lot more convenient than having to charge something and worry about battery life on my uh, yet another device and uh, how those batteries diminish in quality over time and all, all this stuff. It's just way easier to use a wire. I don't know what the what the problem is and pay more for these wireless devices too. How much do those earbuds cost? Come on. Compared to what, 10 bucks for the ones that you and I are wearing? I mean, these ones look big and fancy, but yeah, they're like 10 bucks. They work great. I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And then you try and get them into this, this whole like, oh, there might be even more to it than just being bad for you physically. There might be a more nefarious agenda. Well, I've definitely been convinced for a long time that there is a more nefarious agenda. And uh, Matt, that video you talked about earlier, I shared that as well. So we might as well share that for the audience here. Howard, this is it's at, We can see some police cars there in the area. Is it used for any emergency function or is this uh, like for private cell phone use? Um, I think majority of this private cell phone, it's, it, it's got some other uh, other stuff on there that I really don't want to talk about. But uh, it, it's the majority of it is for private use. Any idea how this happened? Start to work. Do you know what kind of a tower this is? It's you could hear that, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, there's some other stuff on there, but I don't want to talk about it. Oh, mm -hmm. well, I, I thought they were just for cell phones, right? Right, and that's what everyone else thinks. Um, back to um, the guilt and people not wanting to admit that they're handing their child a cancer-causing device and why... Um, people are definitely mind controlled by these things. Um, I mean, we've been getting in line for this technology and people, I mean, the new upgrades and all of it. So it's three different things that are going on here. You've got your screen, it's flickering, right? And it's flickering at a rate that you can't tell that it's flickering because it's flickering so fast. 
Um, but that flickering is putting is basically making you a zombie. It's putting people into a trance. It's impacting their hormones. It's throwing off their sleep schedules, especially predatory on children. That um, that flicker rate is something to talk about. Um, also with LED lights, the LED light stands for light emitting diode, and that diode is actually blue light. Um, the complex compact fluorescence, those CFL twirly light bulbs, those things are predatory as well. There's talk, oh, these things are banned in the United States, and people think that they're banned, but you can still get the, I mean, there's talk of the incandescent he healthy bulbs, the normal bulbs being banned in the United States. They're not banned. You, it's just a rumor that Biden banned them. You can still get the good bulbs, and it's important to be around the good light, especially like the candle light. But the flicker rate of these um, devices, it's flashing on and off so fast that our eyes cannot see it right? Like also the light bulbs, the why, the reason why they say that compact fluorescents are energy efficient is because they're off half the time. They're flickering on and off like 300 times per second. And we can't see it because our eyes can't see that fast, but our nervous system is impacted by it. Our skin thinks it's absorbing light. So it absorbs this crazy light and it definitely puts us on edge and messes with our kids' brains and all that sort of stuff. So the flicker rate of these screens of the light bulbs it's something to understand also it's emitting blue light so much on the blue light spectrum that our eyes can't see it all and it's it, the light's predatory there's harvard research studies that say kids that grow up with these screens looking at laptops and blue light off of the uh, cell phones and the ipads that there will be a whole generation of macular degeneration where these future children will be blind from all this blue light exposure. But the blue light coming off the devices, it throws off your circadian rhythm, your hormones. It, it messes with your eyesight, especially for children. It's really bad. So the kids being blasted with all this blue light, it's important. I, I actually sell, not to make this commercial, but I started selling blue light glasses. I've actually got a couple here. I sell these blue light glasses. I got orange and yellow. The orange 100% blocking. The yellow are 85% blocking of the blue light, more of an educational piece, but also you can put blue light filters on your devices. You can get a little film put over, there's little apps and stuff like that, but less is more. And learning about the blue light is very important. And what it is, is blue light is close to ultraviolet in its color on the color spectrum. And so your body thinks it's in ultraviolet light, which is sunlight. And if you're looking at the blue light or around blue light at night, your body thinks, oh, it must be noon. I'm out in the bright sun. Totally throws off your whole system and your clock, your biological clock is really important because different times of day, you're creating dopamine precursors, serotonin, melatonin, all these different chemicals, cortisol levels, all these things work on a very specific and delicate clock. And if the clock is thrown off by the blue light, you show symptoms like depression and ailments and sickness, and fatigue and all sorts of things like that. And so there's the flicker rate the blue light, and then the EMF radiation also. And that EMF radiation is all over the place. You're on Wi-Fi, you're on Bluetooth. The Wi-Fi modulates, so it's, back, it's not just a, cert, a certain number. Your body's not getting used to, oh, I'm getting this amount of dirty electricity or, or whatever, or EMF. It's all over the place. And then the data and the 5G and the, the new technology of you getting all everyone else's signal and then getting their data and pushing it on with the 5G or the 4G LTE, 4G LTE stands for long-term evolution. LTE stands for 5G, basically. So you're like, oh, I don't have a 5G phone. You got a 4G LTE phone or 4G phone. It's doing the same thing as what a 5G phone would be doing, which is acting as a mobile node, collecting all the data from all around it and pushing it to the next closest device, which is 5G tech. 4G tech, it just takes your data and shoots it onto that cell tower. It's completely different. So you're handing this device to your child you're not even putting it on airplane mode you're not even turning off the bluetooth or the wi-fi so many levels of ignorance and and opportunities for people to gain awareness and educate themselves on wow if i just put a blue light filter on the device turned it on airplane mode turned off the wi-fi turned off the bluetooth and, and handed it to the kid it would have been a little bit different you know or maybe just handing them a book or take them out in the nature you know what i mean or respect yourself with all of this education awareness and, and tools a lot of people don't know half of what i just said and different strokes for different folks but it's very important to start somewhere yeah no i'm in i'm in the deep end with you and if anything i've gone more and more into the deep end 
um, people used to ask, you know, well, what do we need to do? Do we need to move out into the middle of nowhere to get away from it? And I used to say, well, no, you can distance yourself from the devices, especially the ones that you invite into your home willingly. You don't have to have a smart microwave. You don't have to have a microwave at all. You shouldn't have a microwave at all. You don't need to have an air filter with Bluetooth on it and lots of stuff we just invite into our lives that were never necessary in the first place. You can distance yourself from that, from those things. You can limit your time on the devices, especially the ones that you hold in your hand. You mentioned the ethernet cables. Yes. You can hook your devices up to ethernet where you don't even need a, a Wi-Fi router. A lot of this stuff has been sold to us as necessary when it was never necessary in the first place. We've had an internet for a long time. And in fact, it's more reliable on a cable anyways. So you can do that. You can shield certain things. You can you can shield like your Wi-Fi router. Like I have a shield for my Wi-Fi router, and uh, you can even use EMF blocking paint in your rooms, which doesn't actually block it that effectively. I learned from an episode that I did here with Mike from Safeguard Solutions, who goes into people's homes and looks for EMF and mold and stuff like that, and they do these EMF proofing. But uh, I thought that the paint was a block itself, but really it collects the static, and you attach that to a ground. And it drains the static electricity away. That's one thing that could be done. And then there's all kinds of protective devices, some of which I sell. But I guess it's worth mentioning here, just like you and I both noticed that the phone cases stopped working one day. I've been selling EMF devices for a long time. They don't work as well as they used to. Yet they're still the same. They're still the same. It's amazing to me. And it's um, frightening to me as well, because that used to offer a lot of protection for us, and it no longer does. It offers some protection now, but you're paying the same amount. It's the same device, and yet it just doesn't protect you as well as it used to because everything has been turned up so much. So I used to say, no, we don't need to move out into the boonies, but now I've changed my tune in recent years saying, actually, everyone should leave the city, and that's a minimum. And I know it sounds crazy to people, too. Again, it's the false uh, appearance of conveniences or whatever fun. I, I don't know why people are attached to the cities. I hate the cities and I hate the suburbs even more. I don't know why people want to live there. I didn't realize how much I love the country until I lived out there. And yeah, now I'm in the suburb right now and I hate it. But uh, I've gone even further now. In uh, where I live half time way up north in Canada, I'm pretty far away from everything. I'm about six hours away from a city. There's no chemtrails there ever. There is some cell phone towers in town, but it's not 5G or anything. But even still, I don't even want to be in town. First of all, I want to be like an hour away where I have to drive an hour to the grocery store because that's the only way to get me completely away from all these devices and all these smart meters and stuff. And I never wanted to be the guy that's like, OK, well, yeah, we need to go off grid to get off of this. Honestly, I've changed it. I've changed. It. I think we do. <laughs> I think we do need to go all the way off grid to get rid of all of this stuff because I've been battling with the company in my town trying to get my smart meter off. They won't do it. They just won't do it. Oh yeah, we'll call you back. Oh yeah, we'll, we're busy, we're busy. Like, do I have to break it with a sledgehammer to get anything done? Am I gonna electrocute myself if I do this? Like what, mm -hmm. I wanna be off grid. I'm sick of paying these criminals. And uh, you've probably heard the Canadian government, they've been jacking our rates up like crazy with these carbon taxes and stuff. Like we're watching our bills double and triple overnight on our electricity, our natural gas, and all this stuff. And I'm fully ready to say, you know what, screw this. But uh, since I do have a wife and stuff that is not going to join me out in the middle of the woods, I'm almost done talking here. But my personal plan is to build myself a bunker. And I know how crazy it sounds, but I don't care. I'm so sick of being around this and even in my own home, not being able to escape it. And I do work on the phone and computer and I'm saving money to be able to buy a life where I don't need to be on the internet ever. And I plan to build myself a bunker in which I can spend the majority of my time in that is completely 100% EMF proof and no devices will be allowed in and no one will ever be allowed to bring a phone in. And that'll save me a little bit of social anxiety as well because I completely hate being around people who are on the phone. It's the wildest thing to me that we've given up human contact in favor of TikTok. It's insane. And I can't stand being in the room with anybody who's on a phone. And so if you're going to come visit me, you're going to have to come to my bunker and you're not going to be allowed to bring your phone in. Yeah, you won't get signal in there anyways. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> right. Um, yeah, Michael Faraday, he created a Faraday cage where um, basically it's your, you go inside and the walls have a metal mesh and it's grounded and, there's, and nothing gets in. And there's no dirty electricity or anything like that. And there's Faraday tents and, and um, God bless them. And I, I also was on that same tip. I was like, no, 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 we don't need to go to the country. But now we do. We do. We need to go out there and grow food and, and create our own world where people aren't inundated with it all. Because like you were talking about the gym, I mean, the gym, all of it everywhere. But like the gym, I can only go to for so long. And that's where I'm going to get healthy, right? With the fluorescent lights and all the t TVs and everyone's on their Bluetooth and then the Wi-Fi, you know, it's almost counter productive to get to go in there but it's like on where i'm at right now it's super super hot and smoky from the forest fires so it's like i can't really you know in a in all reality i can't do everything that i want to do out in the smoky hot it's like over 100 degrees right now fahrenheit but yeah so i want to talk about this 2003 heidi yellen's bioenergetic study on fabrics, so fascinating, um, this, the study of fabrics. So, and this is because you prompted me and um, and don't mind me for changing the subject just a little bit. No, I so, wanted to bring that up too. And I, I wanted your opinion genuinely on it. I just did that episode, very interesting episode, the killer clothing episode for anyone who hasn't seen it, very worth it. Oh, and, cool. yeah, and yeah, at the beginning we covered this and it's, it's somewhat new to me. I've only seen it floating around. Well, right now I'm wearing um, 100% cotton uh, sweatpants, kind of like it's like a thin sweatpant material. And I feel different in these pants. And then that's just like my whole, you know, that's my story, right? Because there's placebo and all that sort of stuff. But what I did, so, so my personal story is I started noticing a difference in the way that I feel wearing polyester. Like I just like if, if the, the hoodie or sweatshirt I'm wearing is like 50% polyester or whatever, I, I can feel like not super grounded or whatever. Like it was just kind of the way that I felt. And then I started looking at stuff at the stores and everything has got plastic in it. Everything is some blend of plastic. I went to this um, Carhartt is a big brand here. It's like a just durable brand and they make cool jackets and whatever and whatever Carhartt and it's expensive I went to the Carhartt store everything I like had to ask and look and ask and look and I found something that's hundred percent cotton everything had plastic in it and so plastic is cool because it is warm it's not breathable though so it's got to be blended with the cotton anyways because it's total shite to be quite honest with you but they make it because it's warm it insulates right i mean that's not the only reason they make it it's a byproduct of the of petroleum industry and i think it's very predatory at the end of the day like i started really analyzing it and i think that it's it's predatory like if you go to the children's department stores or whatever everything is just polyester it's just out of control different forms of polyester um rayon and all this sort of stuff so in the bible it mentions, and I've been really trying to go down every single rabbit hole possible. I think that the lockdowns opened up so many people's minds and eyes and hearts and souls trying to question the reality in which they live. And I'm so thankful that my film, Franklin Skies, came out in 2017 because during the lockdowns, people were able to go down that path and witness that and to wake up to that reality, which is great because had the movie not been readily available for them, I'd be it'd be an uphill battle at this point, you know, comparatively like the, the movie was fallen into the laps of tens of millions of people during the lockdowns. And, and I'm just blessed that I was able to get it out in that time. So I, I've read in the Bible about linen and how um, linen is this like holy material, but hundred percent lin linen. And then this, how blends of materials. So, so basically what happened is in 2003, this Israeli, doctor scientist she did a study on the frequency of fabrics dr heidi yellen and so she gave she assigned each fabric a frequency um based on its hertz it's, it's like um the hertz that it emits i believe and then she studied humans as well and the kind of frequency that are our, our overall bio 
field emits. So our heart emits a frequency. So does our, our stomach and our brain and all of our different organs and everything in concert, the healthy human emits a frequency. And according to her research, the healthy, healthy optimal human emits a biofrequency of about 100 hertz. She also said that people with illness, they show a, a frequency less than 50 hertz. So like 40 hertz and stuff like that. So there's a difference between a healthy and a sick person. Then she studied the frequency of 100% cotton. And 100% cotton was, organic cotton was the same. It was 100 hertz, right? So if you want to be like in tune with the healthy human or whatever and not have anything like impacting your biofield, you wear 100% cotton and you're chilling, right? You're not being impacted. It's kind of like being around candlelight. It's not like detrimental. It actually feels good. Candlelight feels good. So does um, sunlight or even um, non-fluorescent bulbs, like these incandescent, you know, old-fashioned like yellow bulbs. Then she went on to study um, synthetic fabrics, such as um, like rayon or polyester and all this plasticky stuff. And it had a very low, low frequency, which would potentially even drain the energy of the human. Right. So it's got a, like a value of like a 30 and we're supposed to be at, at 100 and our bodies are very susceptible to frequency and trying to tune, harmonize what we're around. And we put on this fabric that's actually draining our energy. Basically, I think that our, the human body is like a, a perfect kind of clock that you can tune and the biofield gets tuned to the Schumann resonance. Schumann resonance is like 7.8 hertz. And when you're in tune with the resonance of the earth and the cycles of all of the sun and everything that you're in this perfect rhythm, but it's nowhere near this like toxic rhythm of what the toxic you know, plastic clothing is. And it throws off your whole biofield. But then also lastly, which was really cool, some fabrics such as wool and linen and hemp, they are high frequency fabrics but what's fascinating is not the blends so everywhere you go it's a blend it's like 90 percent cotton 10 percent wool or whatever it's never i mean very hard to find a hundred percent latida 100 percent linen this 100 percent hemp this it's always got something in it even if it's just like one percent polyester it's like there you know like read your ingredients my the biggest thing that i ever did to wake up as an activist and become a better person when i was in my 20s i drank a lot of alcohol. I smoked cigarettes. I wasn't a very healthy person. I didn't grow up very healthy. And one of my family friends, she said, well, you got really bad heartburn, Matt. Do you read the ingredients on the food that you buy at the store? And I was like, what the heck does that even mean? <laughs> what do you mean read the ingredients? She's like, on the back, it, it tells you what it is. She goes, if I can't read it, I don't eat it started reading ingredients like crazy. Now I'm reading patents on things and going down rabbit holes. And I mean, even if the ingredient says one thing, it might be um, made in a lab. You know, there's a difference between different types of baking soda. If it says sodium bicarbonate, it might have been made in a lab and not mine. You have to really dig and do your due diligence in this weird predatory world. And reading the fabric ingredients is part of it now, right? And so I really... I have been striving to make natural fabrics for my EMF protection clothing line, but the production process doesn't even exist. So the silver has to be basically melted onto polyester or cotton blend or whatever. So I'm not able making silver clothing. I'm not able to make this perfectly like fabric that's only made out of linen or wool or cotton. So I try to use the protective clothing if I'm going to go to a coffee shop or whatever. But in my world, I try to wear, this is 100% cotton, the shirt that I'm wearing, and my pants are 100% cotton. A lot of the underwear that I find has like polyester in it, even like because it's got to have elastic or whatever, but it's very fascinating. So the so in conclusion, if you get 100% linen or 100% wool or 100% organic cotton or 100% hemp, these things, these fabrics have a high frequency, higher than 100, that can actually give you energy in your biofield and be curative and like increase your energy and like help you out of ailments and improve your fatigue problems or whatever. But then when you mix them together, even the two high frequency fabrics like linen and wool mixed together or whatever, it negates the healing properties. 
So I found that all very fascinating and super important when you're talking about like the foods that you put in your body or the sheets that you sleep on at night. You know, I started being able to like, I couldn't stand certain materials. And now I'm like, my sheets are cotton, you know, and like, it doesn't seem like that big a deal, but it, it does impact your frequency and we're beings of frequency. Like, a lot of people don't want to acknowledge how much we are beings of frequency. We are f- down to our cellular structure, to our nervous system. All of it is in a rhythm. It's in a frequency. We sleep every single night. We're in rhythm with the sun. And everything that we do is actually in a rhythm, if you think about it. And so to step back and realize that we're beings of frequency um, and vibration, it's an important aspect of, of knowing who we are in life. I do find this subject extremely fascinating. Anyone who hasn't checked out that episode, I think you should check it out in full because it's not only this energetic aspect, there's also obviously chemicals. Well, it's obvious to me now after doing the episode and thinking about it just a little bit. But if you didn't know, there's tons of toxic chemicals in in dyes and in the cleaning process. And there's four stages of clothing manufacture in general. And each stage of those can be toxic or poisonous. And there's very little regulations like the stuff that can put in clothes that can very easily absorb into your skin most of it wouldn't be allowed in food at all you know it's it's so toxic and formaldehyde and all this stuff and it's in carpets it's in clothing it's in furniture it's in you know that new car smell you smell a new car that's chemicals right so this is a huge problem and i know it can be daunting it was daunting for me even but uh matt just like you i've been i don't buy very much clothes honestly i'm a pretty simple guy but uh anything i have been buying it's 100 percent cotton I can't really find much linen, but I would like to. And uh, yeah, it's annoying my wife as well. You know, she always wants me to dress better. And I'm, I'm always saying, nope, 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 nope. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. It's got to be 100% cotton. Man, it's hard to find jeans in America that are 100% cotton, right? Everything's all the stretchy. It's it, the mm-hmm. stretchy material that, and they pitch it as the best. Oh, it's so comfortable. I'm pretty sure it's just because most Americans are overweight. and <laughs> They like the stretchy material. I hate it. it doesn't even fit properly. I got to wear a belt. Anyways, yeah, it's been a little bit tough to find some of this stuff. I've thrown a lot of stuff out and um, I am very interested. I've been talking with people. I even know some people who are in the clothing business. I've been trying to get people interested in doing a a 100% all natural clothing line. Even if I'm not like part of it, I mean, I'm willing to be part of it, but just to have a company that does provide, uh, let's go with linen because it seems to be the most, the best one either linen or wool, but wool needs more cleaning than linen does, right? So there's a lot of toxic chemicals used in the cleaning of wool or alpaca because it's just, they're kind of dirty animals. They're full with, you know, dust and dirt and all this stuff. When the wool comes in, it's got to be cleaned and usually they use chemicals to do it. So linen seems to be the best in frequency. And you mentioned hemp. I don't remember hemp being in that episode. Is is hemp also 5,000? I don't know the um, value but I do have it on my list as high frequency, which, yeah, high frequency, high frequency influencing the energy of humans in a positive way. So I'm going with linen right now, but yeah. I don't know where to buy <laughs> linen, underwear, socks, you know, the, the whole thing, because a lot of this research is showing that if you put one material on top of another material or blend it, like you said, it negates it or the fields collapse on each other, like wool and linen, they're like opposite polarity. So even though they're both 5,000, you put them together they collapse to zero. So I've done the same thing as you, gone 100% cotton just because I'm not able to find linen everything. Whereas Mm -hmm. I'm dying for there to be a company that provides this and provides it without dyes. I mentioned in the clothing episode that recently we were in California, my wife and I, and we went into this store that was selling completely natural, non-dyed stuff, cotton, wool, linen, all that stuff. And it was so expensive, it blew my mind. I'm thinking like, how is it that you use less materials here? Because that's what it is, right? You're using less, you're not using any dyes at all. It's just the natural color, whatever it comes with, which are quite nice pastel colors to me. They're quite pleasing. You're not using any dyes. You're not using any like, you know, uh, non-wrinkle or anti-sweat or whatever, any of these extra finishes that they put on it. You're using less materials and yet it's an $80 t-shirt. 80 US dollars to me. I'm Canadian. That's blowing my mind. That's like 110 bucks or something. This is too much for a t-shirt. What the heck? 
so I'm I'm hoping that somebody makes a clothing line that is 100% natural, that is linen, that even if it's cotton as well, maybe have both. But we might as well do linen if it is so much better. And yeah, I would love to promote that company. I'd love to be a customer of that company. And I would love there to be zero dyes at all. And I can actually trust this company that they're not using any of these crazy processes and crazy chemicals and they're cleaning and dyeing and finishing. I think it's becoming increasingly hard for companies like that to offer inexpensive items because they're not given the support. There's subsidies that are going to all the toxic places, you know, and it's becoming increasingly hard for the organic farmer to stay alive, right? When their neighbors are being paid to, you know, round up everything and glyphosate everything. And there's even, I mean, the whole net zero green initiative is, is attacking everything that's sustainable and good and hiring people to not grow their, you know, organic cotton or whatever it is. So I think that the price tags are just going to be there. It's important to try to get it affordable. Yeah, I know. But, but at the same time, it's like organic food and, you know, you name it. It's like you're basically paying not to be poisoned. <laughs> and then the poisons are subsidized and they're dirt cheap. I mean, you can go to McDonald's and fill your belly, but you can't get a salad anywhere for less than 10 bucks. It's crazy. It's just crazy. I see t-shirts here in America, sometimes in a dollar bin for a t-shirt. Mm -hmm crazy mm -hmm. and yet the natural one's 80 bucks yeah i guess i am willing to pay it honestly i am willing to pay it but at this point if i'm going to do that like right now i'm just buying whatever i can find 100 percent cotton and i love going to thrift stores too and i also have the feeling that if i buy something that's really old then it's less likely to have chemicals in it even though in the clothing episode they, there were studies that were like uh testing the amount of chemicals that were coming off of it especially formaldehyde even six months after being washed once a week. And it was still high. So it was like it, there's chemicals in the clothing that continue to come out over time as heat and moisture are applied to it. So it's not like just one wash takes it away. But anyways, I have the feeling that buying something that's very old at a thrift store is, is better for me. It doesn't smell like chemicals and stuff and whatever. But if I am going full board and paying $80 for a t-shirt or more, then yeah, I'm going for linen at this point rather than cotton. And I hope it exists. Have you have you thought about doing this in a clothing company? Because you right now you're limited to uh, cell phone cases and hats, correct? Oh, no, I have uh, now 45 items. And I do also shop at thrift stores myself. And I'll read the labels and get things that are no longer off-gassing. The fact that clothing and furniture and blankets and all these things off-gas for months toxic fumes it's just like that shouldn't even be legal these things that we're supposed to be putting on our bodies it's like oh yeah take it out of the plastic and let it sit in the garage for six months who's doing that you know what i mean i've been growing and growing and growing and growing i now have like sleeping masks and a mesh hood that i'm surprised people wear this stuff i don't i can't even believe that people are wearing the mesh hood over their heads maybe when they sleep or something like that but i've got a mesh hood that covers your whole face and people are buying them I've got baby blankets, baby underwear, men's underwear, baby beanies, all sorts of beanies, um, tank tops and T-shirts and leggings and sweatpants and sweatshirts. And uh, you name it. I've, I've done my best to, to be as competitive as possible. And I feel like that Sparrow, my EMF protection clothing line, is the best in the, in the world. I'm getting really into grounding as well, grounding pillowcases, grounding sheets, grounding, you know, mats and um, that's really important too because of all the dirty electricity that we're surrounded by and the dirt the, the electricity it wants to find its way to the ground it wants to get out it doesn't want to bounce around in your body with your rubber soles on your shoe and i think the rubber shoes are kind of a predatory conspiracy maybe as well it's like all this dirty electricity is wants to find its way out of you not fry your nervous system and mess with your ent entire internal you know balance right all the way down to your gut biome and, and everything right so it's important to ground out dirty electricity when you especially when you've got a lot around you whether it be wireless um, electronics or even just smart meters or freaking power lines so the the grounding thing is the whole thing and then i was talking about blue light um, glasses and all that as well but yeah we've even got socks so i'm really excited about bringing a lot of different products out especially the children's stuff, you know, so that people think 
oh, instead of handing my child this thing, I can protect them from the device that's in my pocket and bring that awareness. And every time people order something, I send them this whole packet. And one of them is like how to protect your children from all of this. Like distance is your friend and la da and all these sort of things. A lot of people don't even realize where the radiation is coming from. Like you'll have an alarm clock next to your bed that checks in with the weather. It's like that thing's getting on the internet constantly, you know, through wireless radiation is radiating while you sleep. It's throwing off your whole sleep schedule. And like people don't grasp why they're getting a bad night's sleep and whatnot. It's because your phone's in your room, your Wi-Fi router's in your room, your alarm clock's getting on the internet right there. It's emitting light. Your body's circadian rhythm's being thrown off. It thinks that the sun is up because that Wi-Fi router or that whatever is in there, or your laptop is in there connecting, you know? So there's, but yeah, sorry. I have a lot of different items now and I am, trying to come out with a, a it's been um talked about a lot in my circle and i do want to come out with a um well rudolf steiner said and this is really fascinating so rudolf steiner um very spiritual author and speaker he said that linen by itself uh protects from harmful uh, emf fields and, and all this stuff so and there's studies out of Russia, supposedly, that linen is is a protective thing. I don't really know all about that. I know that the silver is shielding and protects because of the density and whatnot. And I want to come out, though, with some just organic clothing lines. I mean, I'm already making clothing. And I've got some T-shirts that say, you know, watch my movie, Franken's Guys or whatever, um, actualactivist.com, stop doing new T-shirts, cotton T-shirts. So I am in the market to continue to make some stuff. And so I make 100% cotton t-shirts but i do want to come out with like a baby line um and you know utilize just organic cotton and, and do stuff like that not protective but just good fabric for people that are in the know that are already mitigating and not around the emf but want to you know have high vibration clothing which is really hard to come by nowadays so i'm already in the market and i'm trying to get in there yeah i'd love to explore that and grow that in the next in the coming couple of years especially because we have no options out there. I mean, like, like we've got to resort back to going to thrift stores and buying someone else's really old clothes because we can't find, you know, it's, it's out of control. Well, I did that already because I'm cheap. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, I, I like it. I like the thrift store thing, but it's like if I try to go out and buy something new, I can't. So that's something to speak to. Yeah, true. Honestly, I'm, I'm here in a very uh, fancy neighborhood so-called in the woodlands texas north of houston and the department stores here they're expensive they're they're bougie i would call them i hate them but i'm always reading labels and i'm like i just can't believe that all you got to do is put this veneer of you know fancy bougie whatever in this fancy mall and stuff and and people will pay these exorbitant prices when i'm looking at it and like this is garbage like the material is garbage and i have zero faith and they're not making any claims anyways that this was done in a non-toxic way it's just not part of the marketing strategy at all it's just like we're just going to gloss things up a lot and put more mar marble floors down to justify charging you know 80 100 dollars for a t-shirt whereas it, it has no health benefits at all if anything it's it's got negative health consequences from it because it's not 100 percent cotton in the vast majority of cases or not linen at all i haven't seen anything linen in a long time or even wool, it's all a blend, like you said, it's all got all these fancy colors, these uh, bright colors as well. And all of that is 100% chemicals. So it's just, yeah, they're not even trying. This is not even like uh, Walmart, where I like bringing Walmart into the conversation because they have such a huge selection of organic foods now and other, you know, reasonably healthy things now because they're recognizing that there is a market for this. So even Walmart is doing more to market and target to uh, health conscious people. The 100% jeans that I found around here, we had to go to a bunch of different stores. Guess where I found them? Walmart, 100% cotton, right? With no stretch, nothing like that. It's, it blows my mind, yeah, that a lot of this, the fanciest stuff here is the worst. And you could bring that conversation into cars. You wanna go into cars? I, I've been really uh, interested in the electric car market. And uh, yeah, it blows me away that people are paying way more now for basically an expensive microwave that is radiating you constantly, spying on you constantly, even if it's not an electric car, all the new cars basically are collecting your data, especially if you connect your phone to it with Bluetooth. 
And uh, it's just, yeah, it's just amazing to me. I think these things are pieces of junk. But what do you think about the uh, the health consequences of of new cars and EVs in particular? Uh, well, they're toxic and they're not green at all. There's a book called Cobalt Red. Cobalt Red, um, which you don't need to read the whole book. You can just Google it or, you know, look it up on your search engine and, and see what it's talking about. The book Co Cobalt Red talks about cobalt mining and cobalt mining um, primarily comes out of Africa and it's like people die left and right from it. It's like these open mines where they're just like with a pitchfork trying to get this stuff. And it's super toxic. And um, people that live around the cobalt mines, they also get sick and die. But to the tune of like hundreds of people every day are, just, are dying in these cobalt mines. It's, it's super sad. And, and it's just stripping the earth and it's really bad for the, for the earth and all this sort of stuff. So you get this, little bit of cobalt to be able to make these batteries for the electrical vehicle cars, right? Then the batteries, if they need to get replaced, which they will need to get replaced, some of them are running like $20,000, right? Which is insane that you buy this expensive car and then the battery's life is not even a decade. And then you've got to basically replace the entire car because the batteries died. And if Then you damage if these things, the battery even just a little bit, right, because it's full of cells, if you damage one of those cells, you go over the wrong bump or you accidentally go over a curb or something and damages your battery, the, the entire thing is it's actually junk. And it's it's a fire hazard at that point, too, because it can cause a, a, a cascade and it's called thermal runaway where it just catches on fire and it's an extremely hot fire, like burns through concrete and stuff like it's it's a crazy fire hazard if you damage that battery at all. So, yeah, it, it completely writes it off. And that battery costs more than my whole car. It's crazy. So I was just in Scotland um, speaking at um, these uh, anti-geoengineering, anti-chemtrail rallies. And there's all this talk of electrical vehicles over there because the UK is pushing this net zero, trying to get to no emissions by 2025, 2030, all these crazy preposterous goals that there's no way they can really meet these things. And it's it's all such hypocrisy over there. They'll, they'll say you can't drive into London or you can't drive into these Scottish cities unless... You have uh, a new car that's that was made in the past like eight years. Doesn't matter if it's a Hummer, Land Rover. Doesn't matter what kind of car it is, as long as it's new. So it's really just predatory and preying on the people with their older cars, even if they have good emissions. It doesn't even matter. It's just taxing the poor. So, and then also lithium mining and all this sort of stuff. But when I was in Scotland, there's this whole talk about the electrical vehicles that they there's this one situation where an entire parking garage was burned to the ground like a concrete parking garage because an electrical vehicle on the bottom floor caught fire and you can't do anything you can't put it out like if it catches fire on the street they realize that they can come and get like a crane and pick it up the ball of freaking fire they can pick up with a crane and then submerge it in a dumpster of water so they have to do all this stuff. Firemen won't go anywhere near these things. You basically just have to let them burn out, you know? Well, it's giving And it's... off huge plume clouds of completely toxic. It's not smoke anymore. It's, it's chemical fumes. Yeah, it's unreal. So it's toxic and um, all that. So then at the same time, where's the electricity coming from to charge these electrical vehicles? Well, the biggest charging station in the U.S. is in Nevada, and you pull up and it's a hundred diesel generators, literally in Nevada and like Reno um, there, they have these charging stations ran by diesel generators. Like, like how asinine and backwards is that? But if you're just going home and plugging it in, you're likely plugging it into a coal burning power plant, you know, and also they don't go that far. So you got to make sure, that there's a charging station somewhere where you're going or you're going to get stuck. And then lastly, in the winter, they don't even work. So in the winter, they don't even work. Okay. So, so they're not good for the environment. I mean, from beginning to end, right. They're super expensive. They don't work in the cold. They can be turned off, right? Like the freedom of having gasoline is you can like put some gas in your car and go places and then go find another gas station, fill up the gas, you know, um, some jugs in your car or whatever. And like, you have this freedom of not being 
constantly tracked and traced. Oh, and then you, when you're charging the thing, you better not be anywhere near it because of all the dirty electricity and the dirty electricity anyways from the way that it runs, but and the charging station, like people are pulling up and charging it, sitting in their cars, microwaving the crap out of themselves because of the dirty electricity. People have done videos on that showing the EMF and all that, electro voltmeters and all of it. It's, it's absurd. So all around, in, in my town, people are driving Teslas left and right now because it's like the new green cool thing to do. But it's all like hypocrisy, really. You know, it makes no sense in the end. None of it makes any sense. Yeah. So that's my my whole like rant on that one. Yeah, my neighbor. How do you feel? <laughs> oh, I hate them so much. I think they're they're bad for the environment for all the reasons you said and and more. Especially because they're treated like disposable. Like a you get a new phone every few years, you get a new Tesla every few years, kind of thing. They don't last that long. They're not meant to last that long. The battery can't last that long. And if it does have any damage at all, then yeah, you're screwed. For someone like me who does long haul drives primarily, I hardly even drive unless I'm going from Canada to Texas. It's a four day drive. You couldn't pay me to use an electric vehicle. I'm not going to stand there like an idiot for two hours, even at a fast charge station, which there are no, none of those in the middle of Missouri or whatever, right? I've got to go mm -hmm. through the boonies here in Central America. And then I go way up north. There's no such thing as these high voltage uh, power lines and or sorry, charging stations. And yeah, even if you leave it all the way overnight, like charged into a motel or something, which again, you can't, you just, you can't, these little motels are not going to let you do that. And um, even then you're going to wake up, it's not going to be fully charged. Like it's just not going to happen. The inconvenience for me is not going to happen. Paying more for that is not going to happen. And I live way up north half the time where the weather is extreme. It goes from extremely cold to extremely hot. And, well, not extremely hot. I'm here in Houston right now and it's, it's hot. There was just a hurricane warning here today too. It's not as hot up north, but it goes from extremely cold to quite hot. And yeah, in the cold, you can die. Like you can die if you get caught out there in the car. At least if my car breaks down, like uh, most of the components of it, it's it's a mechanical car, right? It's just a regular engine car. Most of the things that can go wrong in it, I can still turn it on and have heat, right? Even mm -hmm. if it's not physically working, like, you know, my bearing breaks or, or something like that or even the transmission brakes or something, I can still turn it on and turn the heat on. Whereas in these um, uh, electric vehicles, yeah, we saw this last winter and the winter before that where people were stranded up in the Northeast. I think they were in Massachusetts and emergency vehicles were coming by bringing gas to people who were stuck in, in their regular cars and the people who are in their electric cars, like they're just freezing. They're just, you can freeze to death out where I live if, if that happens. So yeah, I would never ever do that. But the EMF is a big thing. And I used to think because Tesla kind of uh, said this, they said, oh, we block our batteries. We, there's a shield between you and the battery so that it's not radiating you. And I thought, oh, that's good. That's that's a good idea. But they don't block the rest of it. You're sitting in the car and it's still like you're sitting inside of a giant cell phone, basically. And you're in a Faraday cage when you're in a car regardless. So even my little vehicle, you know, it's a, it's a 2011 Kia Rio, by the way. It's a, uh, it's still a Faraday cage and that's why I use the case. And by the way, I know this is one of your old models. It's probably not the triple one that you got now, but uh, I still use the case. I don't want the phone in it. I don't have service, so I don't need my phone when I'm in my car, but I need to physically bring it with me. Right. But I turn it off and put it in the case and I use an old uh, iPod for my music, you know, oh, the green screen's taking it out. Right, it's plug in. There's no Wi Fi, there's no Bluetooth or anything like that. Because, yeah, I don't want to put more signals in the car with me because they're just bouncing around and, and staying in the car with me. But yeah, these EVs, they, it, it is sitting inside of a cell phone. It is a cell phone, basically, for all intents and purposes. It is a cell phone. And it's crazy to me that it has come out now that basically every car company has been collecting your data. You know, people hook their Bluetooth up to their phone, they sit in it. So now they're radiating themselves twice. First from the car itself, second from the phone itself. You're trapped in there with it. And of course, every new car has a computer in it, which mine doesn't. And I'm very happy about it, at least the center console thing. But then on top of all that, the car company is collecting your data. And not just to send you like targeted ads, like they're collecting your, your text messages and whatever it is that you're doing on your phone. They have access to that. And that's it's scary. And then, yeah, worst of all, you mentioned it. They could turn your car off. You have a smart car they can turn your car off that's crazy to me we have no idea why they would do that like wh what reasons they will use to justify that we already saw lockdowns and stuff 
And there is already software built into these things that may or may not be turned on where it does give outside access to cut it off. I can't remember what it's called, but the software is already geofencing. Geofencing. That's it. So yeah, chances are you buy a new car. It has geofencing in it, and it might not even be an electric car. They might still be able to shut off your computer just on a traditional car. Yeah, the geofencing is the infrastructure um, for the 15-minute city ideas. So because of, you know, carbon and global warming and all this nonsense, lies, all these lies, um, the powers that be are putting together 15-minute city zones where um, everything that you do should take 15 minutes, they claim. And so you, sh you can't go outside of the zone or you'll get like a big ticket or you won't be able to go outside the zone. You know, your car get turned off or whatever. So you have to stay in your little area. And if you're rural, the idea, the Agenda 2030, you know, conspiracy or whatever, or the writing on the wall is if you're rural, the powers that be want to push you into the cities where you can get your shots and get your monitoring and your updates and your boosters or whatever the heck and be protected, of course, and safe and la da in the country is where the freedom you know, will be, and we won't be constantly monitored. But if you have the geofencing on your car, they'll basically have it, you know, where if you go outside your zone and you're not supposed to be outside that zone because you don't have the credits or you don't have the social credit points or you haven't, whatever it may be. I mean, I think basically at some point in the near future, they're going to say, you're, you're not allowed to go this certain distance per day based on climate change or whatever especially if you live in these certain cities or whatever. And so then the cars will just turn off when you go a certain distance. And that's when it gets really weird. Um, there's dystopian films like Demolition Man, but also there's a movie called In Time, In Time with Justin Timberlake. And it's everything's in zones. Everything's in zones. And you can't get into the next zone unless you have all this, these points or money. It's time, but time is money. And... Um, Basically, nobody can get into Manhattan because it takes like 100 years, which is like a million dollars. So nobody can get into certain zones because these gates have been put up and to limit um, how many people can go to certain. It's to limit the flow of information, really. But they claim that they want to limit the flow of people because the more people move around, the more carbon emissions and all that sort of stuff. But to, to limit the people... And ultimately, it's just a tax on the poor, really. The, the people, the elite with all the money, they'll still be able to free flow and go wherever they want. They won't have the geofencing on their, you know, cars or whatever because they won't have to abide by that stuff because they'll pay their the, whatever it is, you know, because they don't have to because they're the ones making the rules. But, yeah, the geofencing is, is it is um, an open air prison kind of thing at the end of the day where you're not allowed to go certain distances and your government decides where you can and can't go. And it already exists too in drones too. If you, if you try and fly a drone, that's why I don't own a drone. First of all, it won't work without a cell phone. You have to give it internet, right? And most of them, most of these drones, it doesn't work without the app. The app has to be connected to the internet or you can't fly it. Second of all, if you try and fly it in certain places, it'll just stop. It won't, it won't let you, it'll just bounce off this invisible well, you can't fly around power plants and airports and you can't go over international borders or in some cases, even train tracks and stuff like that. So, yeah, it, it's technology completely already exists. And yeah, I doubt much. Great. Of the I audience, didn't know that. That's a good point. I doubt much of the audience has an electric vehicle. But yeah, if you think that you're uh, safe from this type of nefarious technology and you're driving a vehicle that's like 2018 or newer, maybe even older then uh, you're wrong. You're wrong. Your car is spying on you right now. It's almost a guarantee. And there's not a switch that you can flip to stop that from happening. And you are being radiated incredibly, whether it's EV or not. All the new vehicles are super, super high EMF. I can't stand them. I'm very sensitive to EMF. And even my little Kia Rio. It's not a good car, by the way. I'm not vouching for Kia at all. I, it's actually a piece of junk. But uh, it has Bluetooth in it that I can't turn off. There's no way for me to turn it off. The fuse that uh, connects to it, 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 it'll shut more than Bluetooth off. I can't, I can't take that fuse out. And it, you can't hit the button and turn it off. Very annoying. I had a car before that that was a 2009 Pontiac G5. And it was way better. It didn't have Bluetooth at all. I guess Bluetooth came in between 2009 and 11. I, I don't know. I don't remember when it came in. But uh, the 2009 car, it was it was 
less impactful on me. Even still, you're you're still collecting static electricity. You're not grounded when you're in a car, right? Although you can buy a a grounding mat for your car, but it's not a true ground. It connects to the frame of the car, which I got to get one of those anyways. But still, it's not a true ground, but it's a little bit better. But anyways, yeah, this 2011, it's, it's significantly more uh, uncomfortable for me to drive. But comparing that to my wife's car, I don't know what exactly it is. I think it's a 2017 Infinity or something. It's a nice car in, in quotes. She loves it. I hate it. I can't stand it. Got the center console computer and everything. And yeah, if there's people, I usually drive my own car by myself, right? If there's people in the car and they have cell phones on them, it's insanely difficult for me to focus and think correctly at all. Like just this immediate brain fog comes upon me sitting in these newer vehicles and then you add on top of that the the spine and the the fact that it could be connected to these 15 minute city things it's it's absolutely nuts to me old cars all the way i'm i'm down for the havana effect where we're forced to uh keep our our decades old vehicles running forever because of government re regulations basically yeah i'm going uh to get a much older vehicle next time I'm hoping for something pre-1975 with zero computers in it at all. And uh, ho hopefully even a diesel that just that there's literally no electronics in it at all. Don't want a radio. I'll take all the radio equipment out of it. I'm willing to go full board. Bunker car. I love it. Yeah, my car is 2008 and it doesn't have Bluetooth. And whenever I'm in a Bluetooth car, I and especially people on their cell phones and stuff, I mean instantly on edge and anxious feeling it's not a good time for me at all you're just in it you know someone contacted me recently asking me what to do because their dad is getting a brand new car and they don't want to be around all the emf radiation i was um reminded of you ever seen people with older cars and they have like a literal chain hanging off the back yep and it's hitting the ground and it's like sparking i think people do that for the grounding effects Right. And I was like telling this woman to, to hang a chain from her dad's car. She didn't have any idea what I was talking about. So I broke it down to her and it made a little bit more sense. But yeah, so some little kids put some pennies inside my CD player. So I can't play CDs anymore. So I was like, oh, I'll just go get myself a new head unit. Right. Not happening. I can't find one. I called around. I, I have done my due diligence the the like best person I spoke to on the phone said if you would have found if you would have contacted us a few years ago we would have had some older models in stock without Bluetooth but now finding a head unit without Bluetooth is nearly impossible I'm gonna have to literally go to a junkyard and take apart an old car or I don't know what you know like go overseas and stuff like that I mean some of these things do exist somewhere else but I can't find just a head unit without Bluetooth so I can't play cds but it has the auxiliary port so i do do what you do i do do what you do brother i have um a little mp3 player just like you and i plug it in with my auxiliary cord and i download my music with my ethernet and and yeah but i don't i, I can't play cds anymore and i don't have bluetooth thank god um but i've got auxiliary cords for different types of phones and stuff so people get in my phone and want to place in my car i want to play stuff off the phone you know they can, especially if it's downloaded, put the phone on airplane mode and all that. But yeah, it's a real struggle. The struggle is real and the tech just keeps advancing itself. Um, I've had to get a new computer because my older computer wouldn't be able to get on all the websites because the old operating system wouldn't let me get the new browsers. And so slowly but surely I have to adapt and adopt to, to a newer computer. So I'm shopping around for a computer that's not freaking facial recognition and AI and but still has all the bells and whistles and stuff. And I'm having to buy an older system, but soon there won't be anything but retinal scans and facial recognitions and give us your thumbprint and all that sort of stuff. I've even been talking recently, I'm in a nice farm community and I've been talking even yesterday about what are we going to do with when this digital dollar thing comes, what are we going to do? And we are creating plans to go, um, like barter system, like this ledger system where we don't go down that path. We as a community, there's a lot of us that are not going to 
take that route. We're not going to do digital dollar. We're not going to do social credit system. We're not going to do whatever's next, whatever it is. You know, you need a QR code on your phone to shop or whatever replaces the dollar, which it's, you know, the writing's on the wall that something's going to happen. And then, you know, whatever you shop with, with your digital ID, you know, the bio digital convergence or whatever, the, all this nonsense, whatever is on the horizon over the next decade or maybe even shorter time frame. but there's something happening here with both the climate change predatory narrative and, you know, whatever the next bird flu or whatever this nonsense is, but it seems like that the powers that be are not done with their whole agenda, the 5G rollout, more lockdowns. I've even, like, I couldn't believe, like I didn't watch the debates, right? But I started talking to a friend who did watch and then it, it made my skin crawl to know that Joe Biden was just harping and harping about global warming. And then right after the debate, he came out and said that we might need climate lockdowns like next month. Right. So that's I think that that's still on the table before the elections to have climate lockdowns. Right. Because when we had the lockdowns before, evidently the climate change wasn't so bad because we we're all locked in our homes. Oh, and they we were, were happy having, about it. Yeah, you know, the animals were coming out and everybody was not globally warmed anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm glad the conversation has gone here because, you know, this really circles around what to do about all this madness, what to do about EMF and everything. And to me, it is reject it, reject all of it. And I will never shop somewhere that requires my cell phone to work. It's just goodbye. I don't care. We have... Uh, my housemate and I, Chef Norman, longtime best friends, we've purchased pretty much everything that we need to live in the event. We're not preppers at all. Just in the event that something happened, we we actually are completely prepared to do it. We've got uh, guns and traps and fishing rods and tools of all kinds, both manual and powered. But we've also got battery packs and solar panels and stuff to actually power that you know you charge the battery pack with the solar panel and then that battery mm -hmm. pack can run your electric drill or or whatever it is got all, all kinds of this stuff we've got property you know we've had chickens before on that property and we're, we're willing and able to do that again in the farm communities close to us we can get chickens we can get ducks we can get goats we can get all this stuff again we could live off fishing and stuff we just planted some apple trees this year none of us are gardeners but we're, we're working on it uh, my mom just moved out out of the city as well into a smaller town and she's got an acre and I convinced her to get some trees as well, some apple trees. And that's just the start. You know, I've been researching our, we're in different climate zones, my mom and I, but uh, we're farther up North. So we have a limited selection of things we can grow, but I'm looking at walnut trees this year and uh, or, or early spring, whatever, getting walnut trees and apricots, mulberries, pears. I mean, this is quite a lot of stuff here, you know. And on top of that, we've got raspberries and blueberries and strawberries. And it, there's a lot of stuff that can be grown. And I'm focusing on trees because they're a lot lower maintenance than ground vegetables and stuff. Like, I'm not even there half the time to weed the garden and stuff. So it's got to be just a tree for the most part. And anyways, I'm just saying that... Um, all of this modern stuff, you know, people are saying, but I won't be able to go to the restaurant anymore. And don't, don't, you know, the single biggest food expend expenditure in America is restaurants and it's the biggest waste of money. Anyways, it's all bad for you. Anyways, I hate the restaurant industry. Uh, when I was just in California, the last couple of times I had to go two trips somewhat recently, I was blown away. There was two or maybe three restaurants I'm kind of forced to go to restaurants on the road. I hate being on the road. It's another thing. I'll just stop going on the road one day. I'll, I'll just never leave my property ever again. I'm willing to. But there's three restaurants, Matt, that didn't even have prices on the menu. And I'm blown away. I'm like, what, what do you, what, what? And they said, oh, it's because the prices keep changing. And I'm still thinking like, so? One of them, it was a coffee shop with a blackboard. I'm like, just write the price and just scratch it off and write the price again. What are you talking about? But no, you got to use a QR code on your phone and of course you've got to have internet for that to work and i don't have a phone so I'm, I'm eating at these restaurants and just waiting for a mystery bill here i have no idea how much it's going to cost me because i didn't do the qr because i don't have a phone bill and i'm not going to pay a phone bill just so i have the quote uh privilege of dealing with this kind of nonsense 
And I did still eat at those places, but yeah, it was wild to me. Three different places with no prices on their menus because you've got to access it from the internet and yeah, screw those places. I'm 100% looking forward to a future where I don't have to go to the grocery store ever again, you know, where I can hunt, hunt the food and eat it raw and have our own chickens, which again, we've had before. It's easier than you think it is. And people think, oh, I shouldn't have to go to this extreme. Well, you actually do. I'm sorry. You do. The entire food industry is poisonous. The entire retail industry is poisonous. EMF is increasing. It's not going to go away no matter how much awareness we spread. And I don't mean to be too negative about that, Matt. I know we're both committed to the activism part of this, to the awareness part of this. But when we're talking about, what, 1% of people that are both aware and willing to do something about it, we have made zero progress so far. There's There's been zero progress in stopping cell phone towers from expanding or stopping EMF from expanding. I did want to get your take on this. It's supposedly a few states in America, including Tennessee, I believe, and some others have banned chemtrails. Is that a real thing? And, and how did that happen? Um, unpopular opinion. No, it's not a real thing. Um, so what's happening there is, first off, chemtrails are above state level. So states states can't just ban something that the states aren't even in a part of or admitting to even happening. So what I believe is happening are um, things that are being talked about and, you know, maybe laws are being put into place, but they're not admitting that it's even going on already. So they're like, in the future, you're not allowed to do this, but it's, it's happening already. So people that I live in Tennessee and other places that say that they banned it, it's, it's not stopped. It's probably gotten even worse is what people are saying, but def definitely has not subsided or stopped. And what it does in this battle for our souls, you know, like we're in a very spiritual battle and it's, it's on every single front. And what the PSYOP does is it takes away our, our hope. It's an attack on hope. So a few years, I mean, a few months ago, people are really excited. Oh, this law got passed. This law got passed, but it doesn't go into effect till July 1st was the whole story, right? Well, it's, it's past July 1st now and still they're spraying chemtrails in Tennessee and they're not going to stop, right? For people that are in the know, like myself, you know, that, and I'm very cynical and my, naive, my naivety of, you know, a decade ago when I became an activist, I'm still naive in certain aspects but in certain, as certain aspects, I'm very aware and jaded and in the know, especially when it comes to government psyops and stuff like that. And never once did I think that they would actually stop the spraying in Tennessee. I mean, for one, there's neighboring states that would continue to spray and it would drift over. But like I said, no one's admitting to doing it already. And it's above governments. It's even above, you know, Biden's head. I mean, we're talking New World Order umbrella where they're meeting, you know, Putin and biden and trump they're shaking hands and figuring out how to enslave humanity sorry to say you know what i mean but that's depends on how deep into this truth journey you know you really want to take yourself but no what 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 it does is you get on facebook and you're really excited oh you're so excited you're sharing it all over the place and you don't do anything you actually do anything you know, because you think it's just, been done. You think something's been done. So now you think, oh, all I got to do is just write my politician. Something's been done. And I don't have to get involved because something's been done. I can sit on my butt and eat potato chips and watch sports and not become an actual activist. Right. There's all these things that get in the way of us being united, of us being motivated, of us being inspired of us standing up for truth and doing whatever it takes to make a change, to be the change we need, to show the children what's really going on, to, you know, be that light. And it's systematic, right? So then people will slowly wake up to the fact that they didn't really ban it in Tennessee. And then there'll be another psyop waiting for them, for them to regurgitate and be like, oh no, it's actually, you know, Latida, you know, Julian Assange is going to, save us now that he's out of jail or whatever it is, you know, it's something else giving your power away where you don't have to get out there 
and get vocal and realize how powerful your voice is, how powerful you are in your own community, how powerful you are with your own friends, families, and peers, because you have that truth within you, but now you're not even going to spread it around because the politicians are finally doing their job and you just got to write them and they'll ban it from your state too. Let's ban it from my state. Let's get a petition together, ban it from my state. It's like, no, the politicians don't care about you and Kim trails. They never did. Sorry. And I know that's like Debbie Downer, like negative maybe, but I'm a realist and I am an actual activist. And I am out there like grassroots, like boots on the ground, passing out my DVDs and flyers and hosting conferences and going to international summits and going to other countries and all this sort of stuff. I just got back from London. You wouldn't believe how much of London is, is no cash, like no cash, like, like um, touch lists. You just you, like no cash is accepted. And I tried to talk to a lot of places. And during the lockdowns, Antifa, which Antifa was over there. Antifa was going on to places, and even if they just had a tip jar at their pub and didn't accept cash, but they had a tip jar for the bartender. Antifa was smashing tip jars and smashing windows and creating havoc and, and, and literally terrorizing communities, saying this small business is spreading this disease that's going around, right? Because you know, you're, you're harming the public that you're actually killing people because of germs and whatever that everybody needs to go digital and not even have cash. So that's a thing, but the truth, you know, will set you free, right? It's like at the end of it all, it's up to us how much we're going to honor truth. I've committed to honoring truth hundred percent and on that vibration of truth. When I honor it, when I honor it and I'm on that frequency, other things are going to open up on my path and other truths are going to become self-evident. And for me, it's a spiritual journey and it's a life path that I'm on. And yeah, when it comes time, time to it, I'll go live in the woods and fend for myself. And like you, I am prepped with my, what I need to survive if, if the lights did go out and I will become um, self-sufficient and create a community around me where we don't use the QR codes and we, we go back to a barter system and we are farming and are living off the land. I'm not going to do the social credit system or whatever it is that's laid out for me by this AI takeover, whatever it is. But how many people are going to be like me? I don't know. I'd like it to be um, something that's contagious that people really want to honor for themselves and for their children and for the next generation so that we don't just hand them a torch that's literally not even lit. You know what I mean? It's up to us to set the stage for humanity so that the children have a platform so that they can rise above all this instead of just, what, not lining it up for them. Like, it's up to us to you know, pave a road of truth so that the children have a means of honoring that. We can't just hand them a QR code and say, deal. You know what I mean? Well, I love what you said at the beginning that we do have the power and that's actually the reason that they do all this stuff against us you know this government psyops layered on other psyops that is because we have the power i think that's a very very important point that they wouldn't do any of this stuff if they didn't believe that we do have the power to shut them down or to live without them right they want us to believe that we can't live without them they want us to believe that they're far more powerful than they actually are and they are very powerful but, you know, they've got all these myths like nuclear weapons and other other things out there that we fear the government so much. You know, we feel that their power is infinite. And yet it's just not. We are the ones that do have the power. And yeah, back to the earlier conversation, you're talking about not being able to buy a laptop. I encountered the same thing looking for cameras. Every single camera has a Bluetooth function on it now. Well, I don't need to use cameras, I guess. They just don't. Right. I, right now I'm working on the Internet and all this stuff, but. Honestly, if the lights went out tomorrow, I am prepared. It'd be a long bicycle ride back to Canada. And I know my wife wouldn't be happy about it. She gets upset when I talk like this. Like, nah, I kind of can't wait for the apocalypse because, you know, I got lots of books. I got lots of records. I could run my record player off of a battery pack and a solar panel. And, and I could do without music, honestly, if it comes down to it. Like, I'm 100% ready to go, to go into that Mad Max lifestyle. Like, right now, I am ready. We are prepared. We actually lived in the woods about 10 years ago, Chef Norman and I, on his property when we had just set it up and we had no money. We were completely poor. 
we had a small garden with like uh, peppers and some herbs in it. We had a sack of potatoes and we had six egg laying chickens, hens. And that was it. We had no electricity. We had no running water, no bathroom, no, you know, very, very, very primitive. But we made it and we had to leave before winter because it was not winterized or anything like that. But I fantasize about that time now. You know, I, I have way more. I, I, have, I have a living now. You know, we own a house now and I got lots of stuff. I didn't have any stuff before. I would give it all up to go and do that again. And now we have so much more equipment that it would be a lot easier and they are winterized and, you know, we can build more. We have a sawmill now. We can, we can create a whole, whatever you want. We can build whatever you want now. Lots more tools, all kinds of stuff. We're going to get a well drilled very soon. Like a, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm down, you know, they want to go no cash and say, okay, no cash. Okay. I'm out then, you know, then I'm ready. And it's not even about barter. Like, yeah, you can you can barter and we live where we live. There's a bunch of Amish and stuff like we'd be able to trade with them for sure. Certain things, but I genuinely think we could make or grow whatever we need. Maybe very little exceptions. You know, if we need to get some tin or something for a roof, you know, we're going to need to barter that you can't make your own tin in your backyard. But uh, we could do that. We could do that. Barter with food, barter with tobacco, marijuana <laughs> up there is big. Uh, Silver, you know, we've got things to barter. And at the end of the day, you don't, you don't always need tin. You could use something else. So just, just saying. I mean, it, this world is so abundant, full of stuff. And if we use that stuff to live without the grid, then we 100% could today. But uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie Surrogates with Bruce Willis. It's probably mm. the, the last decent movie that he made. The premise of the movie is everybody has their brains like downloaded into these robots. And so everybody just lives in this like sleeping pod and they spend their days actually walking around and doing their jobs in their robot body. But there's this mm -hmm. subset. Avatar. Yeah, Avatar. That's it. And there's this other group of people that just reject it all and they just live primitively. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're kind of the bad guys in the movie. But uh, I think that's what it'll be. You know, I. I do not think that we'll be able to wake 100% of people up and that we'll be able to shut down the government. I know I just said that we're the ones that truly have the power and that's true and I wish more people would realize it. But based on the lack of progress that we've seen since I've been awake, I'm not counting on this happening of a big rising up of, you know, 30% of the population or whatever it's going to need to be. It's going to be like 1% to 5% of us people who are rejecting the surrogate lifestyle. And I genuinely think the surrogate lifestyle is already there right people are living on their phones it's really not an exaggeration to say that they're actually living their life on the phone around here i know it's super hot out it's 97 degrees fahrenheit right now and it's not that comfortable outside but there's no children outside ever mm. ever i almost never see a child outside or a teenager and we're in the suburbs there's lots of kids here there's lots of schools here i never see them outside ever because they're on the phone. They're on the phone. They're not even they're not playing video games anymore. They're not they're not practicing piano or guitar. They're they're not playing in the park. If, if we go to the park, there's some old man fishing in the little man made pond down there fishing for catfish because he's bored. There's no children there. It's it's crazy. They already are living a surrogate lifestyle. They are not aware or do not care about using their phone to make purchases because they already do it willingly. Right? They use their Apple Pay or whatever. I don't even understand how people pay on their phone, but they do it. They hold their phone up to the, the little pay terminal there and they're willingly doing it now, right? So all this stuff, this conspiracy stuff that you and I talked about here that it's like, oh, they're going to make you do this. Like people are already doing this 100% willingly and the majority of them are not going to wake up to it and they're not going to accept or understand why they're sick, why they're not feeling 100%, why they're depressed, even though every single news outlet has been coming out the last couple of years uh, talking about these studies that show that it's an exact correlation. The more time you spend on screens, the more likely you are to be de depressed. And it's even more true with social media. The more time you spend on social media, the more depressed you are, period. And it's for me in the uh, alternative health world, it blows me away because this is the one thing that everyone agrees on. Mainstream agrees on it. Newspapers agree on it. Magazines agree on it. Alternative world agrees on it. 
everybody agrees that the more time you spend on screens and specifically the more time you spend on social media, the more depressed you are. And yet the vast majority of people are not willing to examine this, not willing to think about this. I, I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not going to come up with excuses of why they won't, but I just don't think they will. I think they will happily embrace the 15 minute city because they already did it willingly. They're already not interested in going outside. They're not going very far from their house. They're using their phones for everything. They're using their, you know, that's the equivalent of the RFID chip. They're already doing that. They're already willing to be tracked and traced because they're carrying a tracing device in their pocket, right? The phone is a tracing device. Their, their car is a tracing device. They're, they're not going to reject this. So I think there's going to be some of us who are out there, you know, living in these uh, so-called primitive conditions, although I don't think it's that primitive because we can have generators and all kinds of stuff. You can buy it right now. You can buy Again, we got solar panels that can charge our battery pack. Our battery pack can run practically everything that we have, you know, short of a fridge. And even then, you can use a generator for a fridge, and you don't even need a fridge. <laughs> Honestly, you don't. Need, a lot of this stuff has been sold to us; we never even needed it. Mm -hmm. Maybe this isn't so relevant, but at our house up north, we've always lived out of a mini fridge at a like in the actual house. We never saw the reason to to get a full blown fridge because we never have any food in the fridge. Like we don't have leftovers. I don't know. We just. I see now here in Texas, these big, huge fridges, everyone's got, it's full of stuff. I'm like, this was just never necessary. I don't know. We save tons of money with this tiny little fridge and it's usually empty anyways. I don't know. Don't need a lot of this stuff that we're buying into. Don't need a camera if it comes down to the point where I can't use my camera without being connected to internet and which is going to happen. It's going to happen with practically every device. You're not going to be able to use it without internet and then screw it. I don't care. I don't need it. Read a book. I have tons of books. I got 200 books here in this room that I haven't read. I got hundreds and hundreds of books at home that I could read again. I don't care. I'm willing to go without this. And maybe that's a little bit too much of a rant. And maybe that's a little bit too much for people. But if you're really asking how to get away from it, you, you are in control. I know we can't really stop the chemtrails and stuff. But if we spread awareness, there's at least a faint possibility that something can be done about it. You need to reject it. You need to not use these Apple Pays and stuff like that. You need to not use devices that connect you to you know, the internet of things, you, web 3.0, you, you need to reject that. If uh, you happen to be in the military and you're listening to this, which I doubt very many military people are, or people who are actually spraying the skies, if you are doing this, you need to quit or you're the enemy of the people. If you don't accept that, then I guess I don't really care. You're my enemy. If you're married to or dating somebody in the military who's involved with this stuff, you need to give them an ultimatum. I want you to leave the military or I'm going to leave you. Or you're the enemy as well, just by being married to one of these people. This is what, you know, anarchist mentality was to me back in the day. The anarchist girls that I hung out with, they always said that, you know, if you go home with a guy and he doesn't have a shelf full of books, leave. Don't sleep with them. If they, if women started doing that, then men will clean their act up real quick. Men will immediately go out to the bookstore the next day or, yeah, I know, I saw your bookshelf and that's, <laughs> I, I wouldn't even be talking to you if you didn't really, you know, I wouldn't be taking you seriously. Right. It's just one of those things. So if, if as long as guys and girls, young and old people are willing to put up with their friends and spouses spending their lives on social media instead of building any kind of skill at all or doing anything useful in the world, if they're willing to accept that, then that's what you're going to get. You're going to get the 15 minute city because you are participating willingly in that. But if you make these demands on the people around you and the people that you choose to really build your life with, then you'll be left with friends and family who are not on the phone and are willing to have, have some kind of skills and build some kind of life away from the system. I don't know if that was too much of a rant, but I don't know what else to say. You got to reject it and you got to reject the people who don't reject it. Let them live in this mess. You can leave. And if you do move to the country, it's a lot cheaper anyways. So now you spend less of your waking hours working to pay the tax for the privilege of living in the suburbs. And I know I'm in the suburbs right now. I'm half hypocrite here. My wife's got kids, they're in school, and it's a bit of a mess. But yeah, I think about it now and then too. I'm like, it costs so much for us to live here. So much for us to live here. Everything's a ripoff here. And, and I'm thinking like, for what? For what? Why do I work so hard to pay to live here? So I can go to Walmart? And I don't go to Walmart very mm -hmm. often, by the way. But like, that's what it comes down to to me. So I can go to Whole Foods? Like that's, what is the benefit? right of being in, in modern america what is the actual benefit is so i can go to department stores basically it's the only thing i can come up with because i see no other reason to be living in, in cities or anything like that i don't have a walmart in my town yeah. up north and like that that's the only difference 
and how much more fulfilling it is to actually do your own thing, to learn and grow and grow your own food and be sustainable and learn how to can and I mean, selective breeding and saving seeds. And I just grew garlic. It was the simplest thing ever, but I'd never done it before. I learned, right? I got a little community garden share and I put some garlic in and it likes to grow in the winter. It wants to grow in the winter in the frozen soil. That's so cool, right? I didn't know this. I'm in my mid forties and there's so many things that I didn't know and how fulfilling and grounding it is. My last name is Landman, and I'm still learning <laughs> all this stuff about the land. Like literally I'm learning so much about farming and all that sort of stuff and like you said i've got all these books that i haven't read no because i'm ready for that shift because that day will come and when it does i'll be so happy to adopt that lifestyle and not have to get on facebook ever again i don't care there was like an outage a few months ago where the facebook went down for like 12 hours or like a few hours or whatever i was i was like please god let this be forever like let everybody get in tune with their own self and get grounded and learn about nature and their surroundings and literally give them the opportunity to honor the truth with integrity. We all have our different, you know, bits, how we're going to, how we're going to do it. Like you and I will, will at the flip of, at the drop of a hat, we'll be off grid and we'll, we'll deal. You know, some people are, are still thinking, you know, should I leave the city? Yeah, you should leave the city. If you can do it, if you can't figure it out, there's different, levels of where people are willing to go they're still adjusting to it all but yeah in that movie surrogates they had the the truthers the people that were honoring the truth and not just living their life through a little cell and like joysticking their clone around reality right they're actually farmers and living off the land they painted those people as rebellious rednecks you know, but the, that society, that counter society, that parallel perpendicular society, it did exist at least in that movie. So that is something, but they were conveyed, you know, in a weird way, which they won't be. The people living off grid will be the people living simply not being, what's it, Soylent Green, not being fed the Soylent Green, the processed foods, the, the getting their 100th booster and getting the nano chip elon musk Neuralink, whatever like hive mentality disgusting versions of hybrid human version 5.0 like literally taking our humanity back and bringing actual humans into the world that can reproduce and won't have to you know sell their souls and transfer their digitize their consciousness and be half cyborg whatever the weird dystopia is like i think that the opportunity to go back to nature will be thrilling for a lot of people and maybe not just one two percent like you said i think that there are a lot of people waking up right now and when given the opportunity between digital imprisonment and slavery and actually getting in touch with your roots and showing the children the way i think a lot of people will honor truth you know there's a saying you can either take authority as your truth or you can take truth as authority the choice is yours you know, and I know in my life, I'm going to honor truth and not just honor authority and bow down to some BS. And I think a lot of more people are, are waking up, especially in this day and age. You know, we had a lot of opportunity over the past few years to open our eyes and to, you know, pull the wool off of our faces and whatnot. And I think so many people are not everyone's like jumping in line and, um, you know, hitting us up and wanting to be an activist and, and doing it all but a lot of people are looking at things a lot differently and i think that the next shoe that drops people are gonna people are not gonna be getting in line like they used to and so there's a whole new f formation of society there's people who want to bow to lies and there's people that want to honor their truth and their soul's destiny and yeah there's gonna be a big weird split and i'll see you in the woods <laughs> Yeah, and I hope you're right. And honestly, it might be more than 5% now. You are right. Lots and lots and lots of people woke up in the last few years, at least. At least woke up partially. And when the next thing does happen, yeah, it's not going to be just immediate fall in line for a lot of those people. But yeah, I, I honestly, same thing as you. When the Facebook thing went out, I was like, oh, wow, I don't have to mm -hmm. do this this morning? Wow. Yeah. I hope it stays. Honestly, I hope it stays. I know I make my living this way, but I don't care. I'm willing for the excuse to stop living this way. I hate it, honestly. I turn my phone on in the morning and it ruins my day. Straight up. 
don't mean to be too dramatic, but like it sucks. I regret doing this. I regret going down this path where I made this my living because now I have to work extra hard to get out of it. You know, I'm in a hole, so to speak. But yeah, I could. We're prepared to leave it right now. I just wouldn't have this quality of living. And yeah, you know, my wife wouldn't be happy. But if the power goes out, then, uh, you know, it, it, sorry, baby, we're going to the woods, you know, doesn't matter anymore because you don't have that other choice. But yeah, you know, final kind of thoughts here. I know we're going to wind it down when everything relies on the Internet and the Internet goes out. What are we going to do? And, you know, that's not a weird, paranoid conspiracy theory. Here in Houston, you wouldn't believe how often the power goes out or the internet goes out. It's stupid. And yeah, it's usually just for like 15 minutes or an hour, but it shows that our grid is quite fragile. It's not impervious to weather and stuff like that. And when everything from your payments to opening your car door is dependent on the internet, then you have set yourself up for some pretty spectacular failures when the internet goes out. You know, and it does happen again. People can't buy food when the Internet goes out and stuff. This happened in Canada. There was a big power outage, uh, Internet outage a couple of years ago. And people couldn't buy stuff at the store. They, the ATMs, the Internet, uh, the card payment uh, little things, they didn't work. It didn't work because we only have two cell phone networks and one of the big ones went out and it screwed everybody over for a morning. Well, that's what's going to happen to the whole society periodically when powers do go out and I was just looking at something this morning where the uh, this whole AI thing has increased the power demand so much and they're predicting so much more. Well, our grids are already taxed. Like I said, here in Houston, we're in the energy capital of America and the power goes out somewhat regularly, more than up in the boonies up in Canada. I'm used to power outages up there. It's not a big deal. But when it happens here, I'm like, really? Well, that's because our grid is stretched to the limit. Everyone turns on their AC at once. Boom, it goes out. Internet goes out all the time. It's crazy to think for anybody to think that this would be a good idea to set everything onto this fragile um, foundation where, you know, it's it's sticks and sticks and wires keeping this whole thing together. And those things are quite vulnerable to weather and to certain including including electrical vehicles. Like imagine if all those all those petroleum gas cars were actually EVs, the system wouldn't even be able to handle it. No, it would completely shut it down. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like you to comment. I should have brought this up earlier when we we're talking strictly about EMF, but we talked about this on our first episode. Usually when I post things on my towers account, you get a bunch of nerds come in and say, oh, but that's not ionizing radiation, right? Because I, I post a lot of videos of people walking around with EMF meters and showing this gives off EMF and showing that gives off EMF. And by the way, you mentioned that earlier, get a get an EMF meter. Well, I, I got an EMF meter a little while ago and, I, and showed my wife because she kind of didn't believe it either. We just, we just walked around the house, said, oh, look at that. Everything gives off a signal. The light switches, right, even if they're off, you know, the lamp on the bedside, even if it's off. You mentioned earlier the alarm clock, but like an internet alarm clock. No, it's a regular alarm clock. Any digital alarm clock actually gives off quite a big field. And yeah, she was blown away. And even, even me, I I knew that EMF was a problem, but I'm walking around like, oh, my record player gives off a huge field and it's not on. It's just plugged in. Mm. It's crazy how much of this stuff, the TV, all this stuff, it's not on. And yet it's giving out a major field. So it can blow you away if you aren't aware of how big the problem is. And it's not going to show you every single spectrum, you know, one of those cheap ones from Amazon. But uh, it's enough to open you up, open your eyes up and say something's weird here. And maybe that's why I don't feel good sitting right next to the record player or having the chair up against the, uh, a wall outlet or something like that, because these wall outlets are leaking EMF. So when these nerds come in and say, oh, it's not ionizing, though, how do you explain that? Well, so people think that they're using really big, fancy words. And so their ego is all like they were able to research that, you know um so um, it's funny we were just difference... talking about internet outages and we just got a glitch there so back to the beginning how, how do you explain this non-ionizing or ionizing radiation thing oh yeah so what happens is people get these big fancy words and they think that they've they're, they've educated themselves because they can find the mainstream narrative from msm or what is it uh the fcc or something like that okay 
So the difference between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation is whether or not you can feel it. So ionizing radiation is like you put something in the microwave, it heats up, you can feel it. Or um, say you're next to like uh, something that you can feel because the intensity is so strong, right? Like if you went up to um, a really big uh, AM tower mast and well, maybe you can't feel that, but it would, it would have harm. So ionizing, you can only feel it. Like you go to a nuclear power plant, there's an, a radiation leak, burns your skin or whatever, and you feel it, right? Um, that's what ionizing is, is when there's heat and you can feel it. Non-ionizing is you can't feel it. Just because you can't feel it doesn't mean there's not cumulative impacts, all right? So we can go to Chernobyl or something. I mean, there's, there's a million different instances and people are just parroting the mainstream narrative that comes out of telecom agencies that only have to, um, they only have to abide by standards that were put into place in the nineties, like 1996 telecommunications act that had nothing to do with smart meters, smartphones, or any of this tech, like none of this tech existed when they came out with their guidelines anyways. So people want to think that if you can't feel it, it doesn't impact you. Well, there's there's studies from the Navy. There's infinite amounts of research saying that they're wrong, right? But they're just parroting something that they got off of some website and they think that they're smart because they can say the word ionizing, non-ionizing, right? Well, in Chernobyl, there was a nuclear power plant meltdown or whatever in Russia. And then there's people that live near Chernobyl that didn't feel anything, but slowly but surely they got radiation in their bodies and then they ended up with tumors and you know having um deformities or the animals also had deformities that's an example of of low level radiation um causing harm um brain tumors where people held their phones or tumors in the bra where people have the exact footprint of your smartphone in terms of tumors. So someone holds has their rectangular cell phone in their bra over the duration of a few years or whatever. And then they go in to the doctor, they get the mammogram and they've got eight little tumors that have the right angle of exactly the footprint of their phone. Okay, like, is it corollary? Is it causal? Like, 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 like let's get to the bottom of that. I mean, I there's it's almost impossible that that's just a corollary of relationship and that that phone didn't cause those that right angle of tumors right naval research institute the navy did over 3000 studies in the 70s and 80s they um, measured low level radiation on rats and humans and they showed that it, it does produce harm right there's so there's studies there's logic like, like John McCain, he held his phone to his head. He got a tumor right where he held his phone to his head. He's told the public, I got a tumor because of my cell phone. He got the tumor removed. He kept using the cell phone, got another tumor, got brain, brain cancer, died. The guy died from brain cancer. Did it come from his phone? Many people will say it did. I mean, like not being able to feel something and saying that it doesn't cause any harm because I can't feel it. That's just a mainstream narrative misnomer. And the research is there. There's plenty of research. There's plenty of data to show what um, radiation does that you cannot feel. I mean, those cell towers, they were on hillsides for a reason. And you weren't allowed to, they weren't allowed to put those in the neighborhoods for quite some time. Now they've snuck these things next to people's doorsteps and people are getting leukemia and cancer and all these things it's coming from the cumulative radiation impacts of something that's non-ionizing right i mean long story short the, the research is there you know if you get yourself educated on it you can go to actual activists my website actualactivist.com there's a 5g section there's so much research there on the cumulative impacts of non-ionizing radiation <clears throat> studies out of russia studies by the u.s navy studies on rats studies on humans studies on um, fertility um all the data is there if you're willing to look you know so that's that's really my answer is ignorance is not bliss 
Like people want to go ahead and just take the political stance of, well, you know, Rogers or Verizon or T-Mobile or Sprint or whoever my telecom provider is, they say that it's safe. Of course they're going to say that it's safe. They also say not to put that thing up to your head. <laughs> like if you read the fine print, it says, don't put the phone next to your head. It's like keep it a distance away from your head because it does cause harm. There's studies, um, there's so many different studies on, on br people's brains and it, it gets heated up or or live blood cell analysis after being around EMF that's my radiation. Favorite. Yeah, that's If your blood can't thing. move, you, you are screwed. Right. And so blood cells, red blood cells, all your, your blood reacts to being around EMF radiation. You can see it live with live blood cell analysis. So it's not like I'm just making things up. You know, people, because I've got local groups, like I've got um, a cell tower just got plopped in um, right next to an elementary school in my town. The town tried to fight it. The I mean, people in the town tried to fight it. The town didn't care. And they put this cell tower. It's on a university, like 100 feet from the dorms. And then it's right next to an elementary school and very close to a middle school. So I went out there and did readings before and after. Um, right when they put the cell tower up, I did a reading with my acoustic meter, my EMF meter. And the, it, the, the cell tower was not turned on yet. So the readings were nothing there's nothing was happening in front of elementary school then a few weeks later they turned it on and the readings were in the red on my meter we're talking like um three volts uh, either way very high readings um illegal in some countries you know it depends on where you're at uh, whether or not it's harmful or not right but in russia china and italy these readings would be illegal and they couldn't have it next to a school right but in the united states you're able to have much higher levels based on our lobbyists, really, okay, where I, I made the video and just said, hey, food for thought, if you send your kid to this school, you know, would you want your kid being exposed to this kind of radiation all day long? And in the video, I'm like, look, I liken this to turning the microwave on at your house and leaving your kid next to it to play all day long. Like, I live in a pretty hippie community where a lot of people don't even have microwaves, right? But then they go and they drop their kid off at the school all day long, not thinking any wiser so i posted it in some local groups and so many people trying to educate me on the difference between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation it's like look where did you get that information right you got that off of google you didn't you did one little search and then now you're trying to educate me trust me i well i'm proof in the pudding like i got seriously harmed by living next to a smart meter i now get heart palpitations and anxiety and i feel like there's a a weight on my chest when I'm around um, a lot of EMF radiation. If I'm around Bluetooth and someone's Bluetooth car, I feel like there's a weight on my heart. I can feel the heart having the palpitations, irregular heartbeats. I, I literally can, I mean, and in a lot of places they won't even diagnose EMF uh, sensitivity as a thing. And then other places they will. So that's a whole thing. But it's, it's like at the end of the day, the research is there. There's hypersensitive people out there. I have a whole, clothing line selling clothing to people that are that are protected by it and can feel a difference when they wear the clothes because they are emf hypersensitive and these people do exist um some insurance companies have started to acknowledge that these people do exist and you know what else can you do i mean i've got people all day long saying chemtrails aren't real either it's like it's like we've got to beat the pavement all day long but it's like the the science exists, the studies are there, and you can turn a blind eye to things. I mean, it's just like sea level rise, right? You're going to believe Al Gore or your own eyes, right? It's up to you because the sea levels aren't rising, and there's no global warming catastrophic something that needs to be done because the sea levels are, are rising. There's a documentary called Sand Wars, and, and it's amazing, by PBS, and there's sand mafias that go and steal sand because ocean sand is used for building Dubai and all this sort of stuff and concrete needs sand and all this stuff. So islands have erosion from sand theft and storms, but there's no sea level rise at all. And it's just a fact. So you've got facts and then you've got mistru you've got lies. And the fact of the matter is EMF radiation, non-ionizing radiation, it causes harm in so many different ways. It's been studied and restudied and published and documented. And the research is there and the evidence is there. 
So it's really up to you if you just want to believe authority and lies or truth is my answer. Yeah, it's like saying cornflakes are good for you because the cornflake company told me. Uh, similar yeah. in, in the health right. world, people say all the time, well, I don't, I don't feel gluten, for example. We're very against gluten. Well, I don't feel it. I eat gluten all the time. I don't feel it. Well, you develop some kind of an iron stomach when you eat junk food all the time. And yeah, you're right. You won't feel it unless you stop it. Yeah. And canola oil. People are like, oh, I don't, I don't feel it. It's like your body has become adjusted to the poison. Like, good for you. And yeah, just because you don't feel it. I mean, you're coming to me most of the time. These people are coming to me asking about their diabetes or their blood pressure or their atherosclerosis or whatever it is. What do you think caused it? This I'm telling you what caused it. It's processed foods and nutrient deficiencies, whether you feel it or not. You know, you can eat your sandwich and not feel anything. It does not mean it's not impacting you. And usually all it takes is getting off of the poison for a little while and then try and eat it again if you want proof. And we've done this many times, too. There's been quite a lot of people. It's like, look, you know, I've, I've been listening to you guys for a while. I've been gluten free for a while. And uh, I don't really feel much different. I say, OK, go eat some gluten tomorrow. And they come back and they say, "Yeah, I felt just awful. Just awful eating it. Once you get off of it, now your iron stomach is gone, and now your body will actually be able to communicate with you and tell you that it, it doesn't like this thing. I also grew up in a city suburb, and I didn't know that EMF was a problem for me. I also didn't know why I was miserable and why my, I was physically handicapped, almost, almost physically handicapped. I had childhood diseases, childhood arthritis, and a, and a long list of problems. And it turned out that it was nutrient deficiency. I fixed that. And the pain went away, but I didn't live in a city at that time. When I started to spend more time in cities, I started to realize that now that I know what it's like to be healthy and to feel good, I can clearly see what happens when I go into a city and I feel much worse. That was the awakening for me. And I, I think you become more sensitive once you become attuned to this as well. I started to really pay attention to the sounds around me and things would the sound of like the refrigerator running and stuff would start to bother me. And, you know, I, I know a lot of this is psychological as well, but point is now it's, you know, even if I put my little battery operated uh, iPod on my lap, I, I feel it, you know, it's not a huge, huge field, but it's you can feel it. You become sensitive to it. I'm pretty sure I could do it blindfolded, walk around the neighborhood and tell you where a cell phone tower is or when we're passing one in a car. Anyways, just because you can't feel it doesn't mean it's not there. And final note from my end here, it's something I've, I've been saying more and more over the years, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to keep saying it more and more. In the 10 years that I've been in this business, promoting healthy lifestyle choices and selling supplements, it's become harder and harder to help people. Just like our phone cases stopped working one day, the protocols don't work as well as they used to. And when I first started 10 years ago, the people who trained me told me this. Same thing. They said, Ryan, it used to be easier to help people. We've got better products now than ever. Well, I said it earlier, we got better food availability and better information availability now than ever. And yet it's harder and harder to help people. And the fact of the matter is it will only, this is my prediction, so I guess it's not the fact of the matter, it's my prediction. My prediction is that this will only get worse and worse. It will become harder and harder and harder to help anyone with anything, especially if they live in a city or a suburb. This is not new data that people are healthier in the country, by the way. This goes way, way back to early 1900s where they were finding people live longer in the country, especially once they became electrified. The cities became electrified first, and you could see an even bigger difference there. So this is not new, but uh, people in the country now are having Wi-Fi and having cell phone towers put in their farm fields because they're taking the cartel money to do that, and they all have cell phones and all this stuff. So it's becoming harder and harder to help people no matter where they are. And it will get to the point where people like me aren't able to help you with anything. It's going to be the truth. And I'm actually shifting out of the supplement business. I'm shifting out of the sales business and shifting more into the education teaching because we still do get good results with the majority of people. But it sucks to be in an industry where you know it's going to just become harder and harder to do over time. And people are going to get less good results with the protocols over time. I've already seen it happen, especially in the last four or five years. It's very, very noticeable now, and it's just getting worse. So why do I want to stay in an industry where I know it's going to be less and less and less effective, even as the products get better and better and better, and the food gets better and better and better? Still going to have a harder and harder time helping people. And I really hope people take this to, to heart here. 
I know people who have listened to this entire episode are probably already on board with this, Matt, but you need to understand that this is way bigger than you think. And unless we reject this, it's only going to get worse. If you do not leave the city, there will come a point soon where nothing will help you. And it's already true for many people. If you live next to a cell phone tower, if you live above a subway line or you live right next to a high voltage power line, there is nothing that's going to be able to help you soon, if not already. And it's a, it's a crummy message to put forward, but it's the truth. You want to know the truth? That's the truth. All the products in the world can't save you from these major sources, and they're just going to keep cranking them up. And if you're paying these people, I suggest that you stop. And if you think that the uh, so-called conveniences or the enjoyment factor of being in a city is worth the health impact, I mean, we have the right to disagree on that. But if you're coming to me for health advice, eventually I'm going to say nothing's going to help you. The time isn't there yet. Time is not there yet. We still do help people with basic food protocols and supplement protocols. But again, it's becoming harder and harder. And now my job, the only thing I do is deal with people who are uh, tough cases, I call them. People who didn't get their results on our normal protocols. It's a crappy job to be in, especially when I know that this is one of the biggest problems. Most of these people I talk to, their supplement program's fine. Their eating's fine. What's wrong? I've been saying for a long time that it's EMF. And final thought here, Matt. Although I have been blaming EMF itself as the primary problem for several years, I just recorded an episode about melatonin and sleep. It's called The Miracle of Melatonin. It's not out yet, as you and I here are speaking, but by the time this episode is out, that episode will also be out. I consider that a mandatory episode for anybody who's listening, any fans of the show here, you got to check that out. It's a long episode, but... Wow, is it important? Because now I actually think that you mentioned this, Matt. It's not just the EMF that's the reason why it's harder to help people. I think it's because it's messing with our circadian rhythm, which the EMF itself does. It does mess with the circadian rhythm, rhythm by itself, but also the fact that people are on it late at night and it's keeping them up. They're staying up too late. Just literally, we've messed our sleep up, messed our circadian rhythm up. And therefore, we've messed our melatonin release up. And melatonin, according to the information that we talked about in that episode, I think that that is one of the cornerstones of our health. You know something interesting, Matt? You might not know this. I've pondered this for years. I said, why do human beings live so much longer than every other creature? Basically, you know, we have very similar anatomy to pigs and dogs and other apes, obviously. We crush them in longevity, like not even close. No, nothing is even close to us. The current Guinness World Record uh, uh, holder for longevity, Jean Calmet, she lived to 122 years old, little French lady. She smoked for over 100 years. She didn't have perfect health, like habits, you know. She had some things going for her. We're not going to go into her whole case, but I'm saying that a little old French lady could smoke for over 100 years and that crushes practically every animal on earth. Like there's a couple examples like whales, a few whales that can live a very long time, but they don't live longer than us. Most of them. I think there's claims that some of them could be 200, but they have completely different anatomy. So it's not comparable. Anything that's even moderately comparable to us, we crush them. Why? Is it our intelligence? No, I don't think so. Is it our nutrient availability? Kind of. A little bit could be complicated conversation, but yeah, elephants are smart enough to go into underground caves and seek out minerals and goats are smart enough to scale near completely vertical cliffs to get mineral rich salts, lick them off and stuff like animals can find minerals. So it's not really nutrient availability. Don't mean to boil the mystery too long here, but it turns out that we are the only species, I believe the only species that completely relaxes ourselves when we sleep. And that's in part due to the melatonin and to the circadian rhythm. You know, anybody knows this. Startle a dog when it's sleeping. Boom, it's up. Split second, it's up. What's happening? Right? Knock on the door, dog's up. Doesn't matter. It, it looks like it's in a deep sleep. It's actually not. It's not. So the animal, no matter what animal it is, horse, cat, mouse, whatever, it's never allowed to completely relax and restore itself. 
And it's only since that episode where I think that's the final piece that I've been missing and trying to figure this out. Why do humans live so much longer? We are the only ones that are allowed to completely relax our muscles when we sleep and completely restore ourselves and get into this deep sleep where even if a bomb goes off next door, you know, we're still going to be like, what, what, just, what just happened? Meanwhile, your dog's already jumped out the window, right? The first sense of alarm, it's gone. We're, we're rubbing our eyes. What's going on? Oh, the house is on fire. Oh, man. We're, we're still in sleep mode. It's very, very interesting to me. And so I actually think that the EMF that we've been purposely exposing ourselves to is not only messing with our blood, not only messing with our social, our mind and all this stuff and the blue light and all this stuff. It's just totally thrown off our melatonin and our circadian rhythm. And that may be the reason that it's so hard to help us. It's so hard to help people. I believe it. I believe it. And there's so many different things that are linked to EMF. I've even seen recent studies claiming that diabetes is just an electrical illness. I, I do believe that the sleep time, it is very, very important. And I mean, even if you look at it on a spiritual level, it's when we connect with our spiritual self and, and get in tune with that. It's the only time when we do do that, when we actually are fully not in our physical and giving that side of ourselves energy, which then brings it back full circle to bringing energy to our physical self. So it's, I think, like getting our biofield intact is, it requires a good night's sleep. So it's important to um, push your bed away from the outlet or even go camping, sleep on the soil, you know, sleep outside if you can. Um, but I do agree that the circadian rhythm and, and everyone's just used to being next to their smart TV right before bed and then checking in with their phone right when they wake up. You know, I think it's so important to actually book in your days and have at least an hour on each side, an hour before you go to bed, an hour after you wake up. Like, don't just get on your device immediately when you wake up. Like, let your body gradually wake up. And same when you go to sleep. Like, at least have an hour between getting off all your devices and your screens and all your projectors and LED lights and all that and get back to a more simple, natural way of life where you go to sleep, light a candle, read a book, you know, think about what your ancestors did and why they were able to be so healthy. A minimum of an hour. That's a good policy. Yeah. People Definitely. ask me all the time. They say, Ryan, how are you able to read so many books? I, I can't keep up with you. So I read like an hour or two a day. That's it. I read for an hour before I turn the phone on in the morning. And some days I'll read at night as well. And that's it. And I crush books, tons of them. And if you spent that same time, time hour or two a day learning guitar piano knitting writing anything learning spanish you spend an hour or two a day before long you're going to have a new skill and you're going to actually get something done and that's just the problem people are spending like a hundred percent literally a hundred percent of their spare time on social media that does absolutely nothing for them and we could rant further about that but we're not going to matt where do people find you Thank you, Ryan, for having me on. I really appreciate it. And it's nice to talk to uh, like minded and I mean, like f on a frequency level, we're right, we're right there together. So it's beautiful. Um, please find me. I'm on Facebook at Matt Landman. I was on Instagram, but my entire channel got pulled, sadly, or my platform got removed, whatever it's gone. Um, so I'm on Facebook. Please don't be a stranger. Also, my websites, frankenskies.com. Please check out my movie if you haven't seen it. It starts off in 1920s and goes through the entire historical chronological timeline of weather engineering, weather modification history, and how we got to where we're at today. The movie was released in 2017. I'm working on a sequel, Frank and Skies 2. Updates can be seen at frankandskies2.com. Um, also, my website, actualactivists.com. Um, please check that out. And then my EMF protection clothing line, uh, is Sparrow, which a la it's a Latin word, S-P-E-R-O. Um, Sparrow, it means I hope in um, Italian and Spanish. And it's S-P-E-R-O gear, sparrowgear.com, Sparrow gear. That Instagram is still alive at least. Um, yeah, please check us out. I've got a blog so that you can um, find the phone that has the low SARS ratings. You know which phones have low radiation. Um, all sorts of really great blogs on blue light, you name it, grounding and stuff. So there's a lot of education potential there for anyone. And then check out our shop. All sorts of really cool items there. Please bookmark sparrowgear 
com for Christmas and whatever season, back to school and all that sort of stuff. And here's a coupon code for your listeners, actual activist. So there they can have a discount. And um, please, you know, show some support for the small business that's just trying to be an activist and save the world and play my part and, you know, bring the education and awareness to the youth is really my goal. And um, I really appreciate you, Ryan. And I think last time we did a show, you sent me a book. Thank you for that as well, for publishing that, right? You did that. And um, yeah, and for being an activist in, in your way, which everyone can be an activist in their own way. You know, not everyone, everyone has to have a, a book or a podcast or a EMF protection clothing line. You can just use your voice and speak to your friends and families and peers and bring awareness to these topics, whichever ones you see fit or all of them. But just talking about the ingredients in your food or the materials in your clothing or how the light bulbs are toxic, that might not push away your peers as much as telling them telling them the cell phone is harmful or that chemtrails are real. You know, pick your battles, plant those seeds, and then when they're ready for it, show them all the light and thank you. <laughs> And you can study communication and sales too, guys. You know, I didn't always read health books. When I first started in this business, I realized it doesn't matter how much you know. It matters what you can communicate. So I spent years studying communication and sales techniques. And yeah, a lot of people are out there trying to, you know, shove information down people's throats. That's not a good sales strategy at all, right? It could be more effective to say, hey, you know, I use this phone case. Or like you said at the beginning, like, just the fact of people seeing you do it and saying, what is that? Why, why do you have it? And mine's yellow here for the audio people. Why do you have your phone in this yellow bag? That starts a conversation. And rather than saying, you need to protect yourself from all this EMF and the smart meter and stuff, you, just, you say, hey, I do this because I don't want to be radiated. It's a very gentle way to expose people to it. It's hard for people to get upset about something that you do for yourself, right? I'm gluten-free. I'm going to eat gluten-free. I don't need to go around there telling you to be gluten-free, but you might ask me about it just for the fact that I do it. Yeah, don't discount how much your opinion affects the people around you. We are uh, inherently social beings, and it's only because all of this stuff is socially acceptable currently, like being glued to your phone 100% of the time, that is socially acceptable currently. It's the only reason people do it. The moment girls stop going out with you because you have a phone, is the moment you're going to change, right? I bring it back to women because it's very, very important. But obviously you mentioned as well, your children set the example. If you're on the phone 24 seven, they're going to be on the phone 24 seven. And if we start making these changes saying, no, I'm not going to hang out with people who are glued to their phone. I'm going to go do something for real. I'm going to go play baseball or go for a hike or something. And people who aren't down with that, they're not down with that, whatever. It might uh, be a split in society, might not be. You might influence the people around you just by doing what you do without even telling them anything. Matt, it's been fantastic to talk to you. You know you're welcome back anytime that you want. And we can talk about whatever you want. I know we didn't go that deep into chemtrails and stuff. We absolutely can in the future. And appreciate everybody listening and making it this far. Pat yourself on the back. And remember that you can always find everything that I do on my website, notusbooks.org, including all the books that I've written and helped publish. And the free audiobook versions of my books, they're all on the website hundreds of book reviews and an archive of this podcast is on the website in case we get taken down again and you can download those episodes there for free all of the episodes are released early on patreon for just $1.99 you can see all those and sometimes they're only a week early they're at least a week early but sometimes they're several weeks early if we're very on top of things like right now we're very on top of things and we also do a weekly Zoom meeting there that is on the Patreon every week as well, where we go pretty deep into specific diseases and products. And we always do at least one case study each week. Pretty valuable, I believe. And of course, all of Matt's links are going to be in the description. Check them out. Check out the Sparrow gear. Check out the actual activists. Check out the Franken Skies. And I'm looking forward to Franken Skies part two as well. Matt, thank you once again. Thank everybody for joining. Stay healthy, my friends. Until next time.